everybody, Patrick Connor here, and welcome to the Knuckles and Gloves podcast. Man, we're not wasting any time today. We've got so much boxing to talk about. We got stuff from last weekend, stuff from this weekend, and history stuff, which means I'm here with my dude, Eris Pina, CompuBox operator, and just my pal, history fiend like myself. Eris, what up, dude? How you doing, man? Good, man. Um, kind of hot. It's like 90-something degrees in New York City today, but, you know. Like you just said, bro, there's a lot of action going on. We had a great weekend of fights. We have a big weekend of fights coming up, like a major, major weekend of fights. And um, yeah, we're here to talk some Australian boxing. Let's do it. Yeah, man. I mean, I think that the, we're definitely inspired by this coming weekend. George Camboso is fighting Devin Haney for, I mean, I, I guess the semi-confused lightweight championship. But regardless. I, I, I couldn't even explain the first thing about that. I, I it's it's like if it takes more than a few seconds it's too much but it's some sort of championship point is that it's a fight between two of the top guys in the division this weekend in Australia so we're inspired by that to talk some you know greatest Australian fighters but before that this past weekend Gervonta Tank Davis wound up absolutely destroying Rolando Raleigh Romero who for some reason everybody calls Raleigh's I guess it's because his Instagram, (laughs) I don't, it's like the whole, it's like, it's like calling Chris Eubank, Chris Eubanks. I I don't, I just, it's the same thing to me. I can't get past it, but they do it for whatever reason. And in any case, Gervonta Davis just absolutely destroyed Raleigh Romero with literally one single punch uh, this past weekend after having some trouble early on. But in, if anything, if, if nothing at all, Gervonta Davis showed he has fight ending power and also the crowd clearly demonstrated that he's a star. Yeah, bro. The fight kind of went the way we, um, we talked about it last time when we previewed it on the show. Um, I know a lot of people were like, you know, he's going to get shat on. He's going to get run through. It's going to be easy. He's going to get knocked out uh, like two uh, rounds. And we were kind of like, eh, I don't think so. He's big. He's a big lightweight, much bigger than tank um he has a very awkward style um he's a strong guy he hits hard you know he's unpredictable in his way and we both said that tank was gonna have to take a few rounds to adjust to it and which he had to do Romero made things uncomfortable for him he definitely was wasn't fearless um was fearless he surprisingly worked well off of his jab um he definitely got tank's attention with a few punches here and there and you know in the flurries that he landed and a couple of times it looked like he almost had tank on the back foot like moving away like running after like the fourth round or so when tank got hit with a few shots but Tank eventually, you know, was just biding his time, adjusting here and there, picking his spots. And like he said in the post fight interview, he was just kind of waiting and he knew that it wasn't time to like settle down with him. It was still time to just, you know, pick him apart a little bit. And that's what he did. As like the fourth, fifth round started like, you know, happening, you started seeing him becoming slightly more active. I mean, his, his punch average was between 14 to 20 punches a round. That's incredibly low for that division, just in general. But you know, the placement of his punches was still well. You know what I mean? He's still accurate, even though he doesn't throw much. But like you just said, he has fight-ending power. Tank is the type of guy that he doesn't mind if he loses a few rounds on the cards or after the fight is close and stuff like that because he still has an eraser. It's going to be dangerous if he doesn't up his punch output when he, you know, fights the elite lightweights or junior welterweights, junior lightweight, whatever it is, because he kind of fluctuates um, when at times to step up to like that. But at this point, and he was able to get away with it. Uh, in round six, Romero came in, you know, with a flurry that got completely off balance. And instead of trying to like recover from being off balance, he went even more so. So his momentum took it forward. Tank, like you said, timed him perfectly, landed one monster shot. Um, Romero fell face forward into the ropes and kind of looked like, you know, a cross between Adrian Broner against Maidana. And Martin Lawrence against Tommy Hearns, you know, that famous scene when, when Tommy, when Lawrence, oh, like that. Yep. So, which was everyone, which was the thing everyone was hoping was going to happen. Romero was talking a lot of shit before the fight, like we discussed, was the antagonist for this fight and kind of the, you know, took the role of the villain. So what everyone was hoping to see, Tank annihilate him <laughs> at some point, it ended up happening. Um, the post-fight antics of, of Romero saying, you know, he just got caught with a lucky shot and he was dominating the whole fight. It was, you know, a bunch of BS, man. I mean, it was a close fight. Don't get me wrong. It was a fight that Tank was winning, but it was still relatively close because, like I said, Romero did have some success in the early rounds. But Davis is a star, man. Like, you saw who got brought out that night. Madonna was there. She never really appears anywhere. 
naturally, especially at fights. This is the first time I can remember her being at one. Um, a lot of other big stars, like he has cross appeal everywhere. You know, other sports stars really enjoy watching him. Um, he has big roots in the hip hop community and they all enjoy watching him. Everybody tweets about him. He's a, he's a big star right now. He's one of the biggest attractions in the sport. He's still young and I can't wait to, I really hope that he's going to be matched up against someone, you know, pretty elite in the future because the, the time is ticking, man. You know what I mean? I would die to see him against Ryan Garcia. That's a mega fight. That is a huge mega fight. And it's a fight that came close apparently a couple of times before last year, before Garcia, excuse me, thought he was going to fight Manny Pacquiao. And, you know, they all went their separate directions. But that's a mega fight I'm dying to see. You know what I mean? They've had a lot of beef in the past. They both have massive fan bases that are completely different from one another. It's just, that's going to be a beautiful promotion. And it'll be a great fight too. It's a big fight, no question. It's a, it's one of the bigger fights in the sport in terms of like the the potential reach mm-hmm. or whatever. And um, <clears throat> that stuff counts in, in today's world. And, you know, the way that social media and the way that impressions and, you know, people interacting and stuff like that, the way that that dominates everything, it, it, it matters. So that's a big fight. It's a really big fight. As far as the Romero fight, I thought that uh, I thought Romero could have been up at the time of the stoppage or that it could have been, you know, roughly even or about even. Uh, I mean, it was in the sixth round, so somebody would have been up by a point, assuming you didn't give a 10 round somewhere. But, you know, it, it was a very close fight. What it looked like to me was that in general, we've we've seen this in a couple of Javante Davis fights. He doesn't seem to like when a fighter has volume on him he doesn't really seem to like being pressured against the ropes and then like kept there with volume. Mm -hmm. Um, The problem as we saw, and as we've seen time and time again, is that when you do that to him and you open up, then you're opening up for counters, which is literally his specialty. That's what he does. He finds those openings. And if he finds an opening on you, we've seen that he's got the power to put you away, generally speaking. So And that's what the only yeah, uppercut is vicious His straight left hand is vicious. It's way, brutal. Whatever, you know, it's brutal. And so you can't just like sit around to be hit by it. Needless to say. Um, and so, but I think that we saw, he doesn't really like being pressured. He doesn't really like when his opponents giving him volume. He doesn't seem to like it that much. Not that he reacts poorly to being hit. It's just that he doesn't really, it, it's almost like it takes him a second. Like he needs, it's like, he's almost like, oh shit. Like I wasn't expecting this. Okay. And then when he gets woken up, it's, it's bad news for the opponent. Um, but that's more or less what, you know, what we saw. It was also that I think that somewhat unexpectedly for most people, Romero was able to be awkward enough and skilled enough to be, to be fair it wasn't just like he had a weird style or something he was doing the correct things uh he was doing exactly what he should have been doing it's just that he was himself and he left his punches out there a little bit too much and and right before he got knocked out he seemed to catch tank with two or three right hands where Mm -hmm. he was like kind of pressing the issue and then going after him which is when he got caught just fucking blasted dude it was bad i mean it was was a nasty knockout yeah, it was rough. And there, there's been there were some people that were like questioning, you know, their decision, saying that maybe it should have continued or that it was a quick stoppage or whatever. Dude, if you saw like Romero's face, did he answer the <laughs> instructions? Yes, he tried to, you know, to the best of his ability, he did try. But if you looked in his eyes, he had no idea where he was at. Absolutely none. And when the fight was stopped, he barely even protested either because the same thing. He wasn't. He wasn't with. Yeah. Him. And. He was taken quickly out of the ring because that's New York protocol. It wasn't because like, he was a sore loser or anything like. Um, since the Magda Med um, Abdul Salam of um, tragedy years ago, they've you know New York has <clears> definitely <throat> you know picked it up in terms of um, making making sure proper protocols are taking place. When yeah, they're taking gets, fewer chances. Yeah, if someone gets absolutely concussed the way Raleigh did. You know they're not going to take a chance on that. So. Um, and when you saw afterwards too, when he was being escorted out of the ring and they were following him with the cameras, dude, he, he was with it, but he wasn't with it. Like if they, if Jim Gray yeah. tried to interview him immediately after the fight, like he does all the time with all these other guys who just get knocked out immediately, it, it would have been God. Yeah, I'm, I'm not like a lip reader or anything, but it looked like he was asking his dad, I got knocked out. I got knocked yeah, out. He had no idea. Yeah. And, and that's, that's what it looked like he was saying, but you couldn't hear it obviously. 
but it was like he did not look with it and he wasn't <laughs> i could i could see in the moment because in the moment when i was watching i was kind of just like oh yeah that was that seemed like maybe a little quick mm-hmm. but then they showed the replay which it actually took a while for them to show replay because i think they wanted to make sure he was okay but like they showed the replay and then after the replay and then also seeing the replay on twitter from like that ringside angle yes he had no business fighting dude it was the absolute correct decision to to not fight. he could not defend himself he couldn't even take that would have like, been a vicious finish man. he couldn't like, even take a solid step so it, that would have been a bad finisher too a mean finisher if yeah that would have been a bad like yeah he would have left him absolutely stretched there's no point in that so it was a proper stoppage in my opinion and so i think that on the heels of the fight and on the heels of the fight card, there are going to be a lot of people who say that should not have been a pay-per-view. It should not have cost X. I'm not going to argue with those things. Uh, the way, but I, I'm not saying I like it, but it's also kind of just the way that pay-per-view has developed in the last few years. It is um, yeah. Comparatively speaking, or relatively speaking, when you adjust for inflation, and I know that sounds like some fucking stupid ass shit to say, but when you do adjust for inflation, the pay per view price has actually been about where it should be. Um, you know, back in the day, like people are like, oh man, I remember when pay per views were like 30 bucks. And it was like, yeah, well, that's well, also were. back when gas was like fucking like, you know, 98 cents or some shit. You know what I'm saying? So, like, Let's let's put it into some perspective and say, I don't like the price. I don't like the pay-per-views in general. And I think that if there should be a pay-per-view, it should be a top-notch card. It should be something that's worth paying for. On okay. paper, this was not a, a particularly good card. I thought that it had the chance to be very well matched. And I thought it was like, it was well matched. The fights were overall fairly even. But they weren't wasn't... pay-per-view worthy. Like Lara against um, Spike O'Sullivan. Yeah, like, there weren't like blowouts left and right or anything like that where it was like, oh man, this is some bullshit. But mm-hmm. they also weren't particularly entertaining fights and they weren't like really noteworthy fights either. And so when you put that on a pay-per-view, it's like the, the main event better be some fucking shit, dude. And it kind of wasn't. So I understand you know, the people complaining that it should not have been on pay-per-view. And again, I don't really like it. I'm just saying that uh, that's just kind of also the reality of the situation. I know that Tank's looking to separate from Mayweather promotions or had been looking. I don't know all the details. but Yeah, it seems like he wants to stay. I don't know. Word is now he might be staying with him. I, don't, I can't keep up. Yeah, I can't follow it. And I also don't really care that much. Yeah, but it does But it does affect whether or not it's on pay-per-view and all that type of stuff because there's not uh, an abundance of TV dates that aren't pay-per-view. And mm-hmm. so when you have somebody like this who needs to get paid X, you know, like that's their minimum or, you know, they ain't getting out of bed oh. unless they're getting paid X. But then the TV date that's available is only paying fucking a third of that. Then the only choice is to take it to pay-per-view. So the good thing about it for us fans, and I've said this before, and before we get off this whole pay-per-view business and shit, is that uh, the good thing about about it for fans is that it's a, it is a direct message to the promoter about what that fighter can do or can't do in terms of selling on TV and not just the gate. Because the my last point going off into the weeds here, and I think that I'm actually curious about what you have to say about this too, because something that we've heard for the last probably 15 to 20 years in boxing from pundits and writers and shit like that is, man, gate doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is ratings. We only give a shit about ratings because ratings drive sponsorships, or we only care about pay-per-view buys because buys are, you know, translate directly to money. And so then... <clears throat> those things basically got corrupted, not on purpose, but the way that Floyd Mayweather was able to have success and have success in a way that was so outside the normal formula kind of fucked people up as far as what they thought was possible with pay-per-view and everything. And so now, you know, it's, it's basically just kind of uh, gotten a little bit out of hand as far as what can or can't be done on pay-per-view who should be on pay-per-view and stuff like that but in any case it's just that there's kind of gotten this there's come to this mistaken view you know what i mean excuse me so anyway uh as far as the whole pay-per-view business and that side of it um 
it, I don't know how well this did, but I do know, like I said, it's kind of confusing. The at the gate, it seemed to do very well. And in the past few years, that seems to be more of a concern, especially since COVID, that how well are these fighters doing at the gate? And the fact that Tank has been able to sell in multiple cities now and sell very well, that's significant because especially in the U.S., that's not something that you can really depend on all that often, you know, like outside of the U.S., totally. But in the U.S., it's like you're not, there aren't many fighters putting on or uh, selling more than 10,000 tickets consistently. And he is. Totally, man. He's a he's a star. You know, there's only a few crossover stars in boxing, and Tank is certainly one of them. And, um, you know, to add to your point about pay-per-view, it, the whole thing about, like, pay-per-views that shouldn't be on pay-per-view has been going on for close to 20 years now, I feel. I mean, even before that, like, you know, pay-per-view back in the in the 90s was kind of reserved, like you said, for, for usually, but not all the time, usually, for, for higher stars, guys like you know, Tyson and Holyfield and big fights like Roy Jones, James Tony, for example. TVKO came around in the early net. Well, they were the first ones, obviously, to, to break into the pay-per-view branch with um, Holyfield Foreman, but they were known to, like, put on monthly pay-per-view shows that were more affordable than, like, a big, big card. You know what I mean? Like, if you wanted to get James Tony, Mike McCallum, for example, that was probably a very affordable pay-per-view back then. Um, another one, for example, um, the ill-fated... Robert Kiriolga against um, Kerakim Adafalos. Uh, Kerakim. Anifa Osha, yeah. Yeah. That was a Cedric promotion. That was only nine ninety nine on pay-per-view. You know, and that ended up being one of the best fights of the 90s. Like, things like that, that was really, but pay-per-view usually should have been, like, reserved for, like, big, big cars. Like, Don King usually reserved that for, like, big shows. Aram, to a degree, did that. You know, others, like Cedric and others would, you know, his heavyweight explosion was pay-per-view, but that wasn't really like a, known for being a big card. Like all you have to do is pay 10 bucks and you're able to watch that. You know what Yeah, I mean? but he wasn't putting on pay-per-views otherwise. So it's like, yeah, that makes exactly. Sense. Exactly. So as you know, what I'm getting to is that like, what, what used to catch my eye in like the late, in the early two thousands, I was just kind of like, wait, what? And not only would it be like a pay-per-view, it would be like 60 bucks to pay for it. Things like Marco Antonio Barrera against Mazanki Fanga, uh, Fana, Marco Antonio Barrera against Robbie Peden, Marco Antonio Barrera against Kevin Kelly. Those were all on pay-per-view. Those were all full-size pay-per-views where you had to pay 60, whatever, 50, 60 bucks to watch that back then. And I'm not sure if it was because they ran out of dates at HBO or whatever it was that they had to do it, but like, it was kind of fascinating that Barrera against someone like Kevin Kelly, who was beyond watched at that point, well, you know, I think got blown out in only a few rounds in that fight ends up being a pay-per-view you know and that kind of goes to a point too like floyd was the one was the one like making all that money that showed anyone that you know when it came to pay-per-view what you want to do with it because he only wanted to fight on that fights that probably should have been on hbo <clears throat> like his fight with baldemir even though that was a big fight for the welterweight title that wasn't you know or other fights that might have been just on world championship boxing as opposed to like being on pay-per-view before he made sure everything was on that roy jones started doing that a little bit near the end of his career and other other big fighters too they started preferring to you know take their events be like, yeah yeah i'm a pay-per-view fighter now so right and so i mean it it kind of like almost became more of a necessity or became like a different kind of business decision than what it used to be totally. and so that's that's what i mean is that it's developed and that, and that it's different and so for some of these fighters like tank davis um there might not be an option but to fight on pay-per-view given what yeah, I'm they're... not sure if I can see him back on Showtime again or just regular television. Can you... I mean, in reality, should he? he? Like, yes, he absolutely. probably should. You know, he probably should fight, like... I mean, not if... even should. Like, he definitely should, I think. Like, like yeah. in reality, he probably should fight, like, four times a year and have, like, two fights on regular Showtime or, you know, Showtime mm -hmm. Championship Boxing and two fights on pay-per-view. Or three or three times a year, two on Showtime, one on pay, you know, something like that. Like to me, that makes more sense. And it is a happy medium between keeping him busy and getting him paid and making sure the exposure is correct. Um, but it I obviously I mean, I'm not a fucking businessman for a reason. So, you know, they're the one making the money, they're the one pushing them, and they're doing a good job with it. So clearly he's a star. Clearly, he's one of the fighters, if not the fighter to beat 
uh, at or around lightweight in terms of star power. But this weekend, dude, this weekend's big. This weekend, uh, at least, is it's very big for Australian boxing. It's big for the lightweight division. It's big for George Cambosos and Devin Haney, dude. This is a big fight, man. It's a fight that a lot of people have been anticipating for a long time. Uh, There's been a lot of bad blood, a lot of talking between the two. Um, A lot of comings and goings in between negotiations. Is it going to happen? Is it not going to happen? Where's the fight going to take place? All this stuff. And we finally arrived, man. You know, this confusion that we've been discussing for this lightweight championship. Haney is a WBC champion. Cambosas apparently is a WBC champion. Um, And the undisputed champion at that. But, like, they're kind of, you know, this is going to clear up a lot of stuff. That's the main thing, all right? And <clears throat> Haney, the young, um, well, he is a star. You still want to call him a rising star, but this can be like his moment. You know what I mean? He's traveling, you know, across the world to Australia, enemy territory. Cambosis is feeling higher than he ever has in his career coming off the Teofimo Lopez fight. Confidence at an all-time high. Very difficult style to fight in general. Very, very good fighter. And he feels he's going to whoop Haney. Haney now is also heading into enemy territory. And this is an added thing that's, you know, made the rounds and been a big story um, without his dad and without his other, without his other head trainer, Ben Davidson, for the first time. Like he's, you know, like for the biggest fight of his career, heading into enemy territory against the champion and the two biggest, you know, people that's always been in his corner, especially his dad who's been with him since day one, can't be with him. You know, his dad, unfortunately, um, got, uh, had a charge from what was it, like 30 years ago or something ridiculous. But, uh, that's not allowing them to enter, uh, not allowing them to enter the country. Australia, you know, has really, really strict rules when it comes to, when it comes to stuff like that. So, you know, it is what it is. Um, and as far as Ben Davidson, that's, you know, a whole other issue that we've kind of discussed before, but, um, yeah, this is, that's big. That's a really, really big story right there. Yeah. And if Haney is able to like break through that, which I think he can, man, I think he's skillful enough to like overcome something like that then it's going to be a fascinating fight. You know, Haney is a supremely skilled fighter and no, and looked at as a future pound for pound great alongside Shakur, Tank Davis, and, you know, those like, he's a part of that. He's a part of that group, the future stars of the sport, the one that's going to carry the sport for the next decade or so. Um, you know, Cambosis is the guy that just came on the scene kind of suddenly. Everybody kind of thought of him as an afterthought, just another mandatory challenger that Teofimo Lopez was going to run through. Instead, you know, he put on an absolute performance of a lifetime in a fight again that had so many back and forths, cancellations, going on, all it, it was ridiculous. That was a whole drama in itself before it finally happened. And Cambosis put on an incredible performance, <clears throat> incredible. Like it was from start to finish, man. It was you know he got dropped himself, showed adversity, and still pulled it out, deservedly so. So, yeah, man, this is for all the marbles, bro. This is a really, really big fight. You can't make a bigger one in the division than this at this point. You know, originally they were going for Lomachenko, but I find this to be a fresh matchup and something I'm really hyped about. You know, there's, in my opinion, a lot of question marks, a lot of X factors, a lot of kind of open-ended questions, whatever you want to call, after George Cambosos defeats Teofimo Lopez and is now going at Devin Haney. It's like I, I still don't quite know what that win means, what Cambosos win over Teofimo Lopez wins win means because obviously I believe it's a very good win. We recapped it, we talked about it, et cetera, but Teofimo Lopez has kind of like imploded <laughs> since then. And yeah, to been, say the least, man. <laughs> he's been he all over the map. He hasn't taken that loss well. No, uh, which uh, I get it, you know. But um, so, I mean, without him bouncing back, I, I don't really know what the win means in the long run. And I don't know how to apply it toward Devin Haney, who himself doesn't have a ton of pro experience, despite being undefeated. You know, he doesn't have a lot of fights. George Cambosos also undefeated, but doesn't have a ton of fights. And so it's like, you know, I'm, there's a lot of unknowns here. There's kind of like, these fighters are working themselves out against each other. And that's, that's kind of exciting in a way too. Uh, it's really exciting for the lightweight division. It's exciting for us. Um, <clears throat> and I think that stylistically, it's probably going to be 
a good matchup, at least in terms of like, you know, the tactical battle. Totally. George, George Cambosos is I'm sure going to be looking to make the fight, but also trying to remain somewhat tricky, like how he did against Lopez, yeah. you know, baiting him in for counters and stuff like that and having success. But Devin Haney's very skilled, very fast, again, very young, 23 uh, had a very good amateur career was like the like uh, junior national champion like two or three years in a row or something like that so you know we know that he has a lot of skill and he's been doing this a long time uh, but as you said dude he has an uphill battle for a handful of reasons when your team gets upset I think that that's one of those things where if you're used to a routine as either a fighter or even just a person that can kind of throw your shit off a little bit, can throw off your vibe. You oh, know, Ben Davison uh, lumped in with a whole bunch of people associated with MTK and Daniel Kinahan, so can no, can't travel to various parts of the world. Some of them, I think, can't even leave the UK, period. Mm -hmm. So it's like, like motherfuckers are keeping an eye on them. They're not going anywhere. So that's bad, but it is what it is. And then, then Devin Haney's having to, you know, basically sub in a kind of part-time team. Luckily for him, it's a good part-time team, but still that's a disruption. It's a major dis disruption going in. He's going to have just about nobody cheering for him in Australia. So <clears throat> it's going to be really, I mean, like the crowd is totally going to be against them. Yeah. No way. <laughs> Make all of these factors even. I think that you probably have to give Devin Haney a stylistic advantage, in my opinion. But with these other things thrown in there, it's tough, dude. Because and Cambosis too, man, who's already a tough out as it is, <clears throat> and is you know already a road warrior in terms of traveling. Um, so he's used to that. He knows like what Haney's feeling right now. He's already he's already been there and done that. Um, he is now in his backyard. He's the champion. He feels he's the best in the world. And he's going to have all of those fans in his corner. Like, that's really tough to beat. And Haney also has to worry about the judging. You know what I mean? Like, it, you have to, look, everybody goes, oh, you know, when you go across the pond or you go everywhere, you got to be careful about the judges. You know, that, that's that's nonsense because there's all kinds of screw-ups in the U.S. as well, man. Anytime yeah, it's probably more overseas, in the U.S. than anywhere. The US, they get screwed over too. So it kind of goes both ways here. Uh, it, it's probably worse here than anywhere, frankly. Totally, I mean, absolutely. Yeah, if you really want to be real about it, totally. But Haney does have to contest that, man. He's not a person, you know, he has scored some highlight real knockouts, but for the most part, I don't find him to be a one-punch knockout. No, honestly. yeah, he's not a big puncher. Yeah. And, yeah, it's he's going <laughs> to have to, like, really, like, you know, dominate. I want to say dominate to the point where he's going to, like, I mean, like, he has to, like, convincingly win these rounds to, to win a decision over there. Like... You know, people love to bring up Jeff Horn Pacquiao, for example, of saying, you know, it's can't win a decision in Australia or whatever it is. But it's it's just it's an uphill battle. It is what it is. But I agree with you totally in terms of thinking like if you put skill against skill. I think Haney comes out ahead on that. But then again, that's also what I thought about the Lopez fight. Mm -hmm. That's I thought that, you know, skill on skill, Lopez was going to be the better fighter. And you know what? Perhaps he even was. Perhaps in the in the rounds that he won against George Cambosos, he round he won them bigger. He won yeah. them more clearly. He uh, the success that he had was very good, but he didn't win enough of them. And on top of that, he got beaten up a little bit in a in a couple of those rounds. So it's like. You know, I, I, I'm not gonna. I, you can't just rely on the skill or the ability or like what it is on paper because those other things, those other outside factors, do they mean something? You know, like they, they, they count. Uh, who do you think's been more? And who do you think's been more battle tested? I mean, in my opinion, I would say that Cambosos thus far, even just that one win against Teofimo Lopez, is better than anything. You know, on. Devin Haney's I resume. Mean, totally. You got the you have the Lopez win. Um, I think it was Lee Selby he beat. Um, yep, got that. You got that Welsh Mayweather, Mickey, Mickey Bay. Bay. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, like those he's are, he I mean, doesn't those are, have those a. Are, those are a wide variety of like very difficult styles too. That yeah, fight. it's not a super deep resume. Don't get me wrong. And and on top of that, I think that Devin Haney has a couple uh, more recognizable names in Yuri yeah, Orcas, Gamboa, Linares, and Diaz. Just those three is like, all right, well, those are more recognizable names than, than any three names 
that Cambosos has fought or beaten, but Cambosos, just that one defeat of Lopez counts for more than yeah. those three, in my opinion. So, so and Haney was also badly hurt against Linares. Then, yeah, so and that's chin, another I mean, thing. I'm not going to say he has a bad chin or anything like that, but I mean, it's been shown now that if you tag him, like he can, you know, slightly get stunned or something. And, and that's another thing about uh, George Cambosos is he's wily. He's a little bit awkward with his rhythm. Yeah. And that was also how he was able to get to Teofimo Lopez was he was able to kind of just be a fucking gunslinging weirdo in there, you know, and that's, that's how he did it. And he could, that's that kind of antidote, you know what I mean? To the orthodox fighter, those ultra textbook fighters. Um, and it works both ways though. Because those wily guys can often be tamed by the textbook guys and vice versa. It kind of just depends. Well, so there's a lot of uh, possibilities there. But what do you what do you think is going to happen? Oh, uh, man, it's it's a tough one to call, bro. And I'm always wrong with these predictions for whatever reason. But, like, um, I... I don't really know. That's that's it's it's a really intriguing play. It's it's tough, man. If you I mean you put a gun to my head, I'm probably gonna lean toward Haney, but I don't see either guy really dominate. I mean, I would kind of be surprised if Haney puts on the performance of a of a lifetime and ends up just whooping Cambosis and like you know stopping him late, then annoying him right away. But like I think it's gonna be a really nip and tuck close fight, but I slightly favor Haney in it. USA, you yeah. no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> don't ever do that. Never do that. All right, hacksaw Jim Duggan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. oh, yeah, no. Dude, you remember when, like, yeah, I think he was wrestling in, in can yeah, he was wrestling in Canada on WrestleMania and trying to get a USA champ started. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like an idiot. Hey, that was that was like uh, Hopkins, dude. Anything surrounding the Trinidad pro yeah, promotion, yeah, yeah. as like especially after 9-11 he was like so loud in USA. It was like, dude. Hill, bro. Yeah, man. Well, no, you know, I think that George Cambosos, I think that if uh if I had to like put money on it or something, I'd probably go with Cambosos by decision okay. for for the reasons we talked about. Um, not that I think that he's necessarily the better fighter or whatever per se, but um, well, maybe he is, you know, and I guess if he wins and wins legitimately, then he proves that. But I think that he's got a handful of things really going his way. Momentum seems to be his. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know that the psychological games necessarily get to Devin Haney, but Cambosis is playing him. So I'm going to go with him. Uh, I guess we'll hey, just have to see if he can pull it out. I, I mean, he totally can. I mean, that's he has the better advantage than Haney does in this moment to be able to pull it out, but it's it's gonna be a really really good fight it's gonna be an intriguing fight like it's a fight that everybody's really been anticipating um like i said it's a fresh matchup because people have been waiting for haney to like really step up and fight an elite guy um we've already seen lomachenko for years at this par so it's kind of like all right finally we're getting someone else now like you know no disrespect to loma who is obviously taking care of business in the ukraine and such right now but like this is this is a fresh matchup this is between like, you know, two guys who haven't really been at the top of the division for a long time um, until recently. And now that they're at the top, they're going to actually fight each other. And this is going to like clear up a lot of, you know, the nonsense of what's been going on in the division. Like if Haney didn't get this fight and Lomachenko ended up leaving the Ukraine to, to challenge um, Gambosis, we'd still be in a mess because Haney would still be recognized as a WBC champion. Um, whoever would win this fight would still have to deal with Haney eventually. Now we're just getting to it. Yeah, hope, I mean, hope, there's, I'm sure, going to be some sort of sanctioning body nonsense to contend with, and they're going to try to split shit up again. There's going to be an interim this or that, but at the very least, if it's consolidated now, like, yeah, I mean, fuck it, you know, we don't need Diamond to worry about Redis, whatever. <laughs> yeah, we don't need to worry about any of that type of shit. We should yeah. just ignore it. But yeah, you know, uh, this should be a really big fight. It should be one for the books, dude. It should be one for Australian boxing history, man. That's what we're here to talk about, bro. You like that? You like, you like that little transition? <laughs> that was pretty smooth. Yeah. No, uh, look, dude, they're fighting this weekend in Marvel Stadium in Melbourne. Okay. And I would say that we've come a long, long way from the early days of Australian boxing history to Marvel Stadium, obviously. 
you know, it's uh, it, it's the history of boxing in Australia, like a lot of places, is very, very interesting, at least to me. I'm going to try to make it interesting today. But we're basically trying to talk about the greatest Australian fighters uh, in history. And if not the greatest, also just really notable ones that we want to talk about and fun stuff that we want to talk about, given that we're going to be sliding into Australian fight history this weekend. You know what I mean? Totally, totally. So I needless to say, all right, so I'm sorry, everybody, but this is that, this is that time. This is that time on the history show where I, you go like, all right, get, go get a beer, go get your popcorn, settle in, <clears throat> smoke a bowl, do whatever it is you got to do or must do. I understand. I get it. And I'm not going to interrupt you. In fact, I'm going to take a small swig of water and we're going to get to this baby. Like a number of places all over the world um and when it comes to boxing history not to give the us or the uk all of the credit it just so happens that the path of boxing has followed us and uk sailors around the world much of the time that's not to say that that is the sole reason that boxing has found its way uh, to a number of places but it is a large reason for sure and australia is no uh no different in that regard so <clears throat> people when when boxing followed british and american sailors it was either kind of like through direct exposure like people actually seeing the fights between the sailors either on the ship or off were because of the sailors could be bled dry of their money wherever they were port at port you know wherever they were docked in australia prior to world war one let's set this up a little bit decades of white settlement and exploitation of indigenous people, uh, natural resources led to permanent, like larger cities around Australia, usually based around ports and harbors as, you know, things go. And going into World War I, there were a lot of race-based fear stoked uh, by Austra Australian politicians and writers, mostly centered on whether China was planning on invading somehow um, or pressing into Australian waters but also due to Japan's very quickly changing social structure, uh, basically, basically it's international military position. And the reason why that's relevant here is because to oversimplify in the interest of brevity, Japan went from like a feudal caste society, like, you know, the Shogun and Samurai and all that shit, uh, and kind of less uh, interested in kind of like it, they, they were resisting the outside world and then transitioned kind of like to a point where they were less resistant to the outside world, rapidly modernizing and also like militarily aggressive. Uh, Japan straight up defeated China and defeated Russia in major wars within about 10 years of each other, which is pretty fucking nuts when you think about it. Uh, it seized control of Okinawa you know, it wasn't really showing any signs of slowing down. So again, why this is relevant is because U.S. President Teddy Roosevelt sent an impressive chunk of the U.S. Navy around the globe over the course of about a year or so in order to show off, you know, the U.S. naval power and, you know, waggle their dick everywhere and everything. But under the guise of a kind of sort of, hi, how are you mission to make friends and shit like that all over the world. So in 1908, this chunk of the Navy, which became popularly known as uh, the Great White Fleet, ugh, ugh. but <laughs> the Great White Fleet reached Australia in 1908. And so there was a guy named Hugh McIntosh, who already some boxing people might kind of remember this yeah, name. Remember yeah, very famous name for a number of reasons. There was no secret that the Great White Fleet would be in Australia. So this guy, Hugh McIntosh, was a businessman, and he reportedly got the idea that he should lease land near where the U.S. sailors would be stationed, and he should host fights nearby for money. So Australia was already familiar with boxing. It, is a, it had hosted bare-knuckle fights uh, in the late 19th century, for sure. But one of the more important developments for uh, Australian boxing and boxing in that area it wound up having some international effects too, was that in the 1870s, a dude named Jem Mace arrived in Australia, extremely important to both the history of Australian boxing and boxing in general. So Jem Mace Great was in fighters of all time. Yeah. He was an extremely famous uh, English prize fighter who previously claimed the heavyweight championship of England twice 
and the middleweight championship in England, which was extremely significant. You know, nobody had really done that. Um, and then in, in the, that was in the 1860s and 1870s, he wound up vacating the title. And then he went to Australia in 1877. He held some exhibitions and he sparred with a really good fighter named Larry Foley. So uh, Mace and Foley teamed up and he opened a quote unquote school of boxing, which was essentially a traveling show where they would put on shows of gloved boxing, which, you know, at the time would have been kind of unfamiliar. People would have been unfamiliar with gloved boxing more or less at that time. And also sometimes they would do like fencing and shit like that. Um, and so in any case, keep in mind, Jem Mace was like in his mid forties at this point, the dude was not young whatsoever. He had, his best days were behind him. So he became this dude Foley's mentor, uh, Larry Foley's mentor. And together they stumbled across a little fighter by the name of Bob Fitzsimmons. And together they also trained the likes of Peter Jackson and Albert Griffiths, AKA young Griffo. Um, and so to simply round out the tale of Jim Mace here, he and Foley traveled through Australia and New Zealand, which is where he found Fitzsimmons and Mace's last big attempt was like likely, you know, like in terms of, you know, guiding boxing in any way was with a total bust by the name of uh, Herbert Maori Slade, which he brought who he brought to the U S and the dude was just not good. I guess Jim Mace thought he would be good, but he wasn't good. And so that was kind of like uh, the end of his tale, more or less. But point being, he's clearly very influential Jim Maces uh, in boxing. Around this time, he helped introduce glove boxing to this part of the world and actually a few other parts of the world later on. But that's, that's not part of the story. So fast forwarding slightly, young Griffo, who I mentioned, a guy we'll almost certainly talk about today, snagged the featherweight championship. In 1890, he became Australia's first, first uh, world champion. And he defended it a few times in Australia. Uh, and so he set off for the U.S. And again, boxing wasn't really new in Australia around this time. But as we know, and if you listen to this podcast or watch us, you'll know that we've said before, heavyweight championship boxing is just something else entirely. Most people know this. More importantly, this dude, Hugh McIntosh, he knew this. He knew that heavyweight championship boxing was where it was at. And so McIntosh, long before Tex Rickard, did the same thing for Jack Dempsey versus uh, Georges Carpentier. He had a wooden stadium built for Tommy Burns uh, to defend the heavyweight title against a local dude, an Australian dude named Bill Squires. So I believe Burns had already defeated Bill Squires twice before this. But anyway, they needed a local. Well, go ahead. I said he definitely did. There's a video of the 30 great one punch knockouts of Bill Squires, who was like <laughs> two feet taller than Tommy Burns, but completely inept. And Burns just swings like David against Goliath, just one shot. And the guy yeah, he, he was all they had at the time. So they need an Australian dude. So they got in Bill Squires again with Tommy Burns because they needed an Australian guy to debut the heavyweight to world title in Australia. So in any case, uh, you know, he actually, as the story goes, Burns supposedly fought Squires really sick, but still managed to knock him out in 13 rounds. And at some point right around this time, Burns became really good friends with Hugh McIntosh. And Hugh McIntosh reportedly was the one who pushed Tommy Burns to defend the title against one Jack Johnson. And so Burns made an outlandish demand for that fight to the point where he thought McIntosh would not accept it, where he'd be like, nah, no, 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 we're not doing that. But uh, Hugh McIntosh had made a shitload of money off of Tommy Burns versus Bill Squires. And he just so happened to have the money that Tommy Burns was asking for, for the fight. So he said, all right. And so in any case, uh, according to local reports, which should obviously be taken with a grain of salt here, Jack Johnson was a total pain in the ass from the moment he stepped off the boat in Australia. He said no to every potential referee, which meant McIntosh had to be the referee. Uh, himself, which was crazy because McIntosh had openly bet on Jack Johnson, he had said. And then on top of that, uh, supposedly, Jack Johnson threatened to pull out the fight immediately before the fight and demanded more money. And Hugh McIntosh was like, sure, grab me my checkbook. And the dude grabbed him his revolver and he pointed at Jack Johnson and said, get in the ring or they're going to be carrying you in a stretcher. 
So, it's, I mean, this is the story. I don't know if it's true, obviously. But nonetheless, we don't need any more story because Jack Johnson got out there and beat the ever-loving shit out of Tommy Burns and talked shit the absolute entire time. There was 25,000 people waiting outside the arena, which could hold like 15 to 18,000 people. Trains, buggies, all sorts of shit were totally overflowing with people and overwhelmed. The public transportation system was like a wreck because of this entire thing. And the whole point was it made a ton of money. Hugh McIntosh was in business. He had a brand new stadium, which was called the Sydney State, the uh, Sydney Stadium. And it became known as the old tin shed because it was a wooden stadium that was wrapped in tin sheeting. And so uh, the design made it look like a big single room because it eventually wound up having a roof put over it. And so it hosted a shitload of big Australian fights and a lot of international fighters and a ton of bands and musical acts and stuff like that uh, until it was finally torn down in 1970. So I know that was a long ramble, and but I tried to condense as much kind of general boxing history from specifically Sydney. There's a lot more than that, and we'll get into more in a few minutes, but hopefully that's a nice condensed version of kind of like how we got here, at least how we got to the modern boxing in australia again there's more to to note but decent right not too bad no that was pretty awesome a lot of it i didn't actually realize in terms of like the influence of where it started but that was good so there's uh some of that i had to go off and do my own shit too but some of that is in this book it's called the old the old tin shed which is by uh terry smith came out in like 1998 or 99 or something like that really good book uh, it doesn't go into a ton of detail, but a great book for getting to know Sydney boxing specifically. So, yeah. Um, in any case, who's an Australian fighter then? I mean, I, I mentioned a few there. So, I mean, take your pick, how, wh whoever you want to talk about. But who's an Australian fighter that screams, you know, Australia, Australian for boxing? I mean, you have to mention the guy you just mentioned before, like, is one of my all-time favorites, even though there's no footage of him. I just kind of like him based off of his stories and, you know, all the mystery kind of surrounding him and the lore, and that's young Griffo. I mean, the, the stories that you hear on this guy, like, he fought well over 100 years ago. Um, we're talking late 1800s to the turn of the century when he was active. And the fact that he was just an out-and-out -out alcoholic who didn't train at all, didn't do anything, but might have been the most gifted fighter that ever stepped on the planet is kind of fascinating. And I mean, it's obviously, it's <clears throat> tough to know how much is myth and how much is like exactly. closer to the truth. But, but, the, but the thing is, is that like, you would say, you know, with, them, with there being no footage, oh, Harry Grubb, you can't be good. We don't see, we can't actually see how we did it. Like, I get it. There's no footage of Griffo. There's barely any footage of any of those guys from that era like any of them for that matter but like generally speaking everybody from that era who was like you know a prominent writer or fight or his fellow fighters from that generation they all said the same thing no one you know no one called it myth they all said that they would see griffo do what he did and that he was the most incredible being that you had ever seen in your life like they all said it everybody was in general you know the general consensus back then was that he was a genius and I, you know, everything that we've read, I know you've read, I've read it, everything like that from all the writers, the fellow fighters that he fought, uh, the fans, everybody, everything that's been documented, talked about how good he was in the stuff and the feats that he was able to do. And a lot of those people said that they witnessed it themselves. Well, and, and of course, the most famous feat being that he could stand on his handkerchief. A handkerchief. And that he would that that put he his, it. yeah, his square hanger, rectangular, whatever handkerchief on the ground. And he'd stand on it with one foot and he would say, I bet you can't hit me and I won't take my foot off the handkerchief. Mm -hmm. And so he would just, you know, zip, 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 you know, <laughs> and he was they, like his version. He was like today's version of in terms of like a bar game, because that's what that kind of is. Right. I mean, yeah. Imagine, you imagine you and a bunch of your boys go in there. You see this little tiny guy with a giant pot belly, probably because, you know, he was always drinking. He was out of shape and just looking haggard telling me oh yeah you can't touch me i'm saying i'm gonna handkerchief you know give me five bucks if you can or whatever it is and i'll bet you that 
the other four. If you're down there with your boy, probably one of you is going to take that bait and walk up to them and try to swing on them. Just kind of like that, that machine today, when you go to a bar or wherever you may go and you have that punch machine that gets everybody all wild up <laughs> yeah. to, test the, <laughs> to test how many, you know, the points you score and how, you know, I've seen that shit. I've seen fights break out because of that. People arguing about how hard they can hit and stuff like that. I can just imagine in the, in the turn of the century and whenever it was when Griffin was hanging around random bars, completely blasted, can now even stand up, but you still can't punch him in the head. You know how pissed off people were probably getting from that? Yeah, no shit, dude. And honestly, he he barely looks like human. I know. <laughs> like, I mean, he looks like some Jim Henson shit, dude. He looks like when, like, back in the day, I went to Catholic Catholic school and grade school, and they had an awesome library, and I used to go through there and look through all the book covers. Mm-hmm. He looks like one of like the monsters on one of the book covers or something, dude. He just he just was a pe- peculiar looking dude. He definitely doesn't look like a fighter whatsoever. And so he was discovered. Uh, like I said, similar to kind of how Bob Fitzsimmons was discovered according to lore, but he was actually a, um, a newsboy, like a, just like, you know, a, a number of fighters. He apparently was a newsboy when he was younger and had picked up something on the streets, but um, loved to drink. And according to a whole lot of reports was basically blasted fucking drunk just about any time he got into the ring in his later years, especially. And on top of that, though, like you, like you had said, even though we don't have any like video footage of this, um, it's like, are you, do you feel as though you can trust the reports? And if you do feel as though you can trust the reports, he spent a, a good chunk of his career, like pretty much the last half of his career in the U S so there are U.S. writers who saw him plenty of times. It's not like some, you know, far off shit, like some people never seen boxing before or something like that. And they're like, wow, how good he is. No, he spent a sizable uh, chunk of his time in the U.S. and fought George Dixon two or three times and fought him to a draw. And George Dixon was notably an extremely good boxer and obviously a very good fighter himself. So in any case, just because we don't have video, like it sucks, but we can rely on a lot of the reports. And he was obviously a very tricky fighter and a very good fighter and fought a shitload. Totally. And I was trying, like, I, um, there was a couple of them. I was trying to find a story now and I just found it actually to talk about his defensive, you know, his defensive prowess. And the thing that was so remarkable about Griffo, first off, he fought everybody from that era. You know what I mean? The, all the contemporaries. He fought George Dixon, who was, you know, the first superstar of the sport, more or less, alongside John L. Sullivan. And Dixon was at the, the downside of his career by the time guys like Joe Gans, Frank Ernie, Terry McGovern, and, you know, those guys were coming up. But he was still very active. He had a very long career. Dixon was still considered one of the great masters of the sport. He could barely touch Griffo when they fought. They, they all fought draws if they went the distance, but it was all known from there. Um, Joe Gans, for example, you know, it was like, I'll, I'll read you the quote right here, actually. He goes, um, I'll never forget my experience in the ring with that kid Griffo. We met in the ring at the Olympic Club in Athens, Pennsylvania, and it was agreed that we would divide the purse, win or lose. I trained for three weeks for the bout, and when I got a flash of Griffo in his corner, I noticed that a fold of fat wobbled over his belt. He was in fit condition for a sanitarium instead of a prize ring. And I told Herford, Al Herford, Joe Gans' manager, that I would make short work of this Australian phenom, as they called him. Um, Yep, okay. As as they called him. We were to go 15 rounds, and I I thought I could do Griffin in about three punches at the weight. I had an idea that he would keep away from me, but that's when he fooled me. He would naturally think that a man in his condition would steer away from a punch, but he crowded me for the first round and in tap of the gong. He clearly outboxed me, but every time he tapped me, I smiled at him. See here, old chap, he said. I'm out for a draw, and don't get awfully rude with me because I have a blooming pain in my stomach, and if you slam in me once in the body, it will be all off. So don't get rude and be a gentleman. I tried my prettiest to bore a punch into his stomach into him, but I only caught him on the glove at every trial, and then I switched my tactics and tried for his jaw, but he was inside me at every punch, and when I led, he stepped inside and showered a rain of taps with both hands. He had me tired once, I will admit, and it looked at me as if everyone in the crowd was throwing boxing gloves at me, 
It's a pity that a boxer of his talent never took care of himself, as he was the greatest defensive boxer that ever lived. And the most peculiar feature of his defense was that he was up at the opponent and at the opponent all the time, fighting close on the inside of the guard. They talk about Fitzsimmons as a fighting machine, but as a mechanical boxer, Fitz never clashed with Griffo. And another story I can, I can attest to as well about Griffo, which was pretty funny. Um, I believe the fighter was Myster Mysterious Billy Smith, another contemporary of that era, welterweight champion, a guy that was just one of the dirtiest fighters in boxing history, another crazy stories with him. So I think Smith and Grippo didn't, I, I'm being, I'm being honest, I might be wrong with the name, but I think it was Mysterious Billy Smith, but they had a beef, him and Grippo, right? And walks into a bar one day and he saw Grippo there, as, as is usual. And Griffo was, you know, I think doing whatever he was doing, getting drunk, getting a massage, doing something. Um, Mysterio's Bailey Smith picked up a spittoon, all things, and wailed it at um, Griffo's head. Griffo, who already, I guess, someone aware of him that, you know, Smith was around, but like, but he didn't even turn his head, like nicked it, just switched his head like that, and it barely even nicked him. And then he kind of turned around and smiled and went back to his, his business again. And Smith just kind of fumed and stormed off. Like, you know, the, the story's there, man. Like, he fought, again, he fought everybody from that time. We mentioned Joe Gans. We mentioned this one. He fought Kid Levine, who um, was a, one of the best lightweight champions at the turn of the century. Tremendously, tremendously tough guy. And, like, Joe Gans kind of said in that, in, you know, in that quote I read, like, Griffo probably could have been the boss of all those guys if he wanted to be, if he actually took care of himself, if he put himself in shape. This was a dude who barely, who never trained a day in his life, went to the ring drunk most of the time or hungover. Um, there were other times like when there was many stories that Griffo, that Griffo was scheduled to appear in a fight while he was on his tour from Australia and America. And he never even appeared. And people were like jeering in the audience, what's going on? Oh man, I heard he's drunk over at Julian's Corner. Oh yeah, that guy's a drunk. He's the audience getting rowdy. Yeah, I heard Griffo's drinking somewhere. Where is he? And, every, you know, people are about to start rioting. Finally, someone runs to the bar, finds Griffo completely stumbled over drunk, really grabs him, drags him to the ring, slaps him up a little bit, throws water on him, something kind of wakes him up and throws him in the ring. And Griffo just does his, you know, does what he did. It, it's, it's fascinating stuff, man. Nicolino Loesch ass motherfucker. But just on like the next time, well, on, like some next level shit, man. And... Again, like he, you know, he was a boss of these guys, and you know, he had a little bit of bad luck with some of these things. He totally beat Jack McCuffley by all accounts. Um, I think it was for the lightweight championship, right? Yeah, McAuliffe. Yeah, McAuliffe. And by all accounts, Griffo was outright robbed in that fight. Like McAuliffe retired soon after that as undefeated champion or whatever. But you know, when they're fighting Coney Allen, they said that Griffo boxed circles around him. It wasn't close. Um, when he became champion, he beat you know the notoriously tough uh torpedo billy smith but other guys that he could have really bought man you know he just he struggled a little bit because like kid levine world's ahead of him in terms of skill and just overall everything but levine was a tough-nosed dude who didn't stop throwing punches could hit hard as a rock couldn't hurt him and was just a rugged rugged ass guy who wasn't gonna wasn't wasn't gonna play that game with griffo of just you know swinging and trying to miss he was like you know, maybe like a Maidana, if you really want to talk about like terms of like, you know, similar styles, maybe, right? And just hitting everywhere and, you know, made fights that like he probably won in terms of just like that. Same thing with like Gans being able to stop Grippo a little bit later on in his career and stuff like that. Like just a guy with so much immense talent, but a huge waste too. Um, if he was around today, man, God knows what people would be saying about him. Talking about just talking about his antics all the time online. Oh, we saw Griffo again at a bar. Oh, Griffo again. Blah, 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 blah. Kind of like, you know, how white people talk about Broner and such. Yeah. No shit. <laughs> yeah. Like how people are about to call the feds because he's burning money. Oh, yeah, same shit. Yeah. That's. <laughs> 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 nah, dude. He's needless to say, uh, apart from just being kind of like a, a, a part of Australia's boxing history, you know, and mythology it's a really important part of the history and mythology because he was Australia's first world champion. And just an overall badass dude, man. Like the stories that you read about him, um, you see photos of him, you're like, well, really? That's the most defend that's the greatest defensive fighter ever. Yeah, you know, what do you put on for Australia? Till over, wait, like again, 
this we're talking probably like you know over 120 years now since he was active and if you talk to most historians people still consider him you know like one of the greatest defensive fighters in history or just talk about his lore and his stories like that's never gonna end man he's he's that's some history for life it's crazy stuff and at the very least it's an awesome story about the handkerchief you know yeah, totally it's, it's totally. good shit and like walking i mean again if you walk into a bar imagine just seeing that type that whole scene right <laughs> you walk and you just see a dude griffo standing over there and you're just like wait what the fuck is going on ask the bartender hey but what's happening over here Oh, that, that's Griffo. He's a, he's a former fighter, but, you know, he just goes there and, you know, he wins bets, but uh, you can't punch him. Why don't you go over there? We'll try it. Really? Okay. Cracks knuckles, walks up. Hold on, I got this, man. I'm going to knock this bum out in a second. You go, you swing your Sunday best, and the dude just sits there and laughs at you. you get pissed off, you swing another one, you get pit, you know, you miss another one. Now you're getting really, really fuming because you're getting embarrassed in front of your boys and presumably some of the baddies in there. And... Now you're like, fuck this, and you're really going to try to swing it, which means you're going to get cute with him. And even though he's drunk, he still has reflexes. So he reflexes back and just probably hits you once and flattens you. <laughs> yep. That should, yep, that should be just like that scene in Crocodile Dundee. <laughs> <laughs> nah, dude, it was, it was cracking me up because, uh, you know, going into this weekend, the uh, Camboso's Haney shit, dude, you know, it's like they're they're pulling out all of the the Australian stereotypes. They got the Wallabies on the poster, mm. the Sydney Opera House, even though there are fights in Melbourne and not Sydney whatsoever, which is a totally different city. But regardless, <laughs> nah, man. We got to pull out all the Australian stereotype stops for this show. Um, now, it's funny too, because when it comes to Australian boxing, you and I had talked about this it's like a few other countries in that some of the biggest fighters from Australia or that some of the biggest fighters who fought out of Australia weren't even Australian or weren't born there. Um, however, there were a handful of, there have been a handful of fighters who not only were born there, but have indigenous blood. And so I want to talk about the very first indigenous Australian world champion, which would of course be Lionel Rose. Lionel Rose, the legendary bantamweight champion from the late 1960s, you know, he defeats a guy named Rocky Gattolari, who himself, I want to say, was Italian and like a, an Italian uh, transplant who, I mean, was just talking about it, then became the Australian bantamweight champion. And so Lionel Rose defeated him for the Australian bantamweight championship. And so that in and of itself was significant because another guy that I want to talk about in a few minutes, Jerry Jerome, Jerry Jerome was the very first indigenous Australian to win an Australian championship in boxing. But then Lionel Rose became, I'm not sure if he was the next one, but he was definitely one of the next ones, uh, one of the next indigenous Australians to win a national title. But then after that fighting Harada, who was an absolute beast, one of the greatest ever Japanese Japanese fighters. Some might say even now the best Japanese fighter of all time. One of the greatest um, Asian fighters in history. Just yeah, no question. Great Absolutely great. no question. And Lionel Rose went to Japan and defeated Fighting Harada in Japan for the Bantamweight Championship, which itself was just massive, absolutely massive, and made huge waves in Australia. Dude. And not only that, man, like Lionel Rose, he, he became like a really popular commodity because at that point, the Bantamweight division was firmly entrenched in like the Mexican and LA scene. And yep. Lionel Rose did not like shy away from that. He headed right over there and caused a riot against Chucho Castillo, for instance. Yep. <laughs> um, uh, you know, for the other thing about Rose that I always, I'm, I never met him or not, anything like that, but like he always seemed like a happy go lucky guy, didn't he? Like you I, saw the photos of him celebrating and stuff afterwards with big fights. He always had a giant smile on his face. He always just looked like he was a very, very good fighter, a popular fighter. Um, after he lost the title to Ruben Oliveras, he did struggle and fell off a little bit, but like he, he was adored, adored by everybody. Even, you know, later on after his career ended and stuff like that, he would, you know, be featured in. Um, different magazines, you know, catching up with him and stuff like that. Same thing. You'd see him, I guess, you know, with his ukulele, other stuff. Like, he was a very happy-go-lucky guy. It just seemed like a cool dude. Yeah, and he was a big uh, pipe smoker. Yes, totally. 
Yeah, he's used to smoking. He's, he's one of the guys that was like smoking all the time during his career. You yep. know, another guy like Nicolino Loche and a few others we've talked about before. Which is nuts, but totally. Jesus Christ. But yeah, dude, you know, one of the, like you said, he met the, a number of the Mexican and Mexican Americans at or around Bantamweight around this time. The guys who were really popular fighting either at the Forum or uh, at the Olympic. And so a number of these fighters got really popular in and around LA, uh, obviously because there's a huge Hispanic population in Southern California, Mm -hmm. but also, but also, you know, they had fought there a lot. They became familiar with the local fans, whether they were Mexican, you know, and some other uh, Latino members, of Latino community or white, whatever they were, they came to know these fighters um and so in any case the first fighter after defeating fighting harada that lionel rose defeated was jose medel who was himself a really hard punching bantamweight from mexico city uh and a very popular fighter himself and so when lionel rose defeated oh, God, jose, man, don't don't go by his record he was a bad man jamma. he was a uh, yeah he, and he, he, he beat fighting harada didn't he yeah, and he was he was also really popular. So I mean, it's not to say that when you defeat somebody popular, like you automatically assume their fans or become popular yourself per se, mm-hmm. but it definitely helped and it definitely was kind of an inroad to getting to you know that Southern California boxing population and where the bantamweight division was obviously hot. But then he took it back to Japan, Takeo Sakurai defeated him you know almost as like almost like a slap to the face but no not really it was just more that the the bantamweight rankings were filled with mexicans and japanese fighters at this time and so he went back and you know showed that off and then alan rudkin who was the british bantamweight champion at that time he defeated alan rudkin and so that then came the chucho castillo fight that you were talking about woof and woof dude i mean like castillo was adored absolutely adored in the bantamweight uh division back then you know what i mean kind of like ruben Oliveira's. a lot of those guys were they're all super duper popular they always pack the la forum or everywhere else around there like big fights very good fights and castillo was a dog man um a guy like i said he was a nemesis and a person right in the mix back then with him jesus um jesus pimento and you know ruben Oliveira's, who eventually ascended to the top um and Rafael Herrera, like all kinds of guys from that time. But Castillo and and Lionel Rose, and it's a fight that I have actually, I'll admit I've never watched. But Castillo was one of those type of guys that most of his fights you never really blew him out, man. Like he was a very very tough guy to beat. He gave Oliveira's fits in a classic three fight series, um, you know. And it was you know by all accounts a super duper close fight. And the fact that Rose was able to pull it out in Castillo's you know backyard of the forum. Um, probably didn't go over very well because of that. Because, you know, Mexican fans are very, very passionate. And in a fight which was a split decision that Castillo, you know, probably made extremely close, they, they're not going to take that lightly, especially for a dude who is an outsider coming in defending his title and they want, they're want looking for a coronation. So what do Mexican fans usually do? What, what they do? They rioted. <laughs> they caused fires. They overturned cars. Um, they probably threw a lot of liquids at people and, you know, fights breaking out and people freaked out. I mean, you know, that is what it is. <laughs> Yeah, dude, he, Chucho Castillo. Oh, those, those, those crowds were really rowdy back then, man. Look at the, for instance, Zarate Zamora. First round, a guy's in his boxer shorts and, you know, and a, and a wife beater runs into the ring, somehow trying to stop it or keep peace before he got taken out and pummeled by the police. Um, the, the fight that almost caused a riot afterwards, where I think uh, Zamora's trainer tried to attack uh, Zarate's trainer and the whole shit that, from there, like, you know, people were very passionate understandably so chucho castillo was himself pretty popular and you know he was a very good fighter a very aggressive fighter and i think that that was a big reason why i mean i'm not excusing the the rioting and the you know the crazy shit but um i think that was a big reason why because he the fight's on youtube so i mean you know obviously anybody's free to watch it and i i have seen it it's been a little bit but i have seen it basically uh chucho castillo hurts uh lionel rose a couple times early on earlier on in the fight and he hurts him pretty good but lionel rose comes back and he has a difficult style to deal with his rhythm's real tough 
you know, he's really good at a mid and, and long range, uh, you know, keeps a really good jab working, kind of a good one, two. And so he was able to keep Castillo on the outside for probably the majority of the rounds, to be honest. But you know how that goes, dude. You've been to live fights where like one guy hurts the other guy early on or something like that. And then for the rest of the fucking fight, like people don't even see anything that happens after that. You know what I mean? Like rounds aren't even scored after that. It's just that this dude hurt the other guy. So he, that's the one who deserves to win, you know? And so whatever, you know, you score fights how you score them or whatever, but they got loud. They got passionate. They started, you know, uh, you know, uh, setting the place on fire, <laughs> took it to the parking lot, fucking started turning cars over. Dude, there's West Coast can, version of Bogolata. It's, it was bad. It was bad. I'll, uh, you know, I'll, I'll try to transpose some photos because I have some photos from it onto the screen uh when i edit well, the video seriously hurt or anything like that i don't believe anybody was hurt but i'm pretty sure there were some arrests and there was like oh, significant damage yeah. like there was there was damage to the forum there was damage out in the parking lot to some cars it was bad and i mean you know look dude like i'm i'm all for righteous fucking demonstrations but that's like not that righteous so you okay, know not. Yeah, not that righteous but regardless uh people were passionate and the point is the larger point is that lionel rose was willing to put himself in harm's way he didn't just camp out at home he didn't just kind of protect the title or sit on the title during a very difficult late 60s early 70s period for the bantamweight division a very deep division that was hot as shit he put himself right in the middle of it and so that it that alone is admirable and he did pretty well for a guy who didn't have a whole lot of punching power no i mean that's a that's a respectable reign man alan rudkin was a very good fighter like you said joe medell that wasn't a title fight but still he was a bad man pajama and dominated him chucho castillo in a fight that you know by what you just said he probably should have won that's an incredible win because he went in his backyard to pull that off and then he decided finally to fight, decides to fight ruben olivares Ruben Olivares not only considered maybe the greatest bantamweight champion in history, but at that time, dude, he was cream of the crop when it came to Mexican fighters. You know, he's fifty-two, and, and he's still up there. He's still got to be yes, up there. Totally. That he never gets. He always, never gets that love. You know, it's always like one of two guys. It's always Chavez or Sanchez, because, and I get it. You know, and but... I get it too because Olivares comes from that era where he was around the same time as um like Vicente Sal Saldivar, mm -hmm. another guy who's extremely underrated extremely underrated mexican fighter yeah very and good defensively totally just a very just a great fighter high work rate just a badass in himself but you know oliveras at this point was a wrecking machine okay 52 and 0 just destroying everything in his sight and same thing man you know at, at his peak of his powers like you said lionel rose wasn't a big puncher to begin with and was probably going to struggle in a fight like that he, he had no chance he got pummeled and beat up and stopped no shame in that. Oliveras did that to most guys before his own vice started taking over and he, you know, he started losing fights that he probably should have won. But like, um, you know, after that though, his career did petter off a little bit. Like he still had a couple of good wins, but when he really stepped up again against a guy like Yoshiaki Numata, who was a champion, um, a junior, a junior lightweight champion in the early seventies and overall a really tough guy himself, a guy who never gets brought up, but had a couple of highlight real knockouts, like one against Rahul, uh, Raul Rojas, who was another champion from that era and just an overall really tough guy, another, you know, traveler. Um, yeah. So he lost that and that, that was basically the for him. but you know, he's still remembered fondly by a lot of fans, um, current fans, even past fans, in Australian boxing history. He was a loved, he was adored and a good fighter. You know what I mean? Like he, he had a good retirement too. Like he had health issues and stuff like that. Like you mentioned, he was a heavy smoker and he did other stuff, but, um like i said i believe he was a he loved singing he did other things like that and you know was a popular guy yeah he was really popular there's a whole bunch of really fun photos uh before we move on to another guy there's a there's uh a whole bunch of really fun photos of him from when he came to southern california he went to disneyland and he's sparring with goofy and shit yeah yeah, yeah. you know but um there's a couple of really good photos where he was presented a samurai sword after defeating fighting Harada that he's like parading around with the samurai sword and shit, you know, it, anyway. Yeah. A, a very cool story, obviously very um, uplifting, very inspirational and historic, 
for a handful of reasons and important. Good to remember. Totally, totally. Um, so another guy I bring up a little bit more modern, but one that, you know, probably about 30, a little over 30 years ago when he was making waves, Jeff Harding. Jeff Harding's another guy that was really fun to do. Just not, I'm not going to call, consider him one of the greatest Australian fighters in history or wherever you want to rank him, but like, he was just fun as hell to watch. Man. Yeah, he's a, what a two-time fun, light fun. heavyweight champion. You know, he's and one of the, and very one, significant. One of the most, and one of the most underrated trilogies in boxing history. Oh, man, yeah. Yeah, like the, the Dennis Andres. Oh, yeah. my God, man. Dude, all of those fights were just awesome. Especially, though, the first two. Like, dude, Harding was just a fun, fun guy to watch, man. He yeah, had those a, punches he, that they're chucking were just like, ooh, ooh, you know. Yeah. Just, just hitting each other with some heat. And what I liked about Harding is that, like, he was a dude you can kind of relate to. You can tell he didn't really take the training seriously. He was a young guy. By all accounts, he liked to hang on the beach and just kind of drink fosters and surf and shit. You know, he, but he was just tough. You know what I mean? Like, a lot of Australians, just a really tough guy, gritty, and he could punch like a mule. Yeah. Um, Sometimes, yeah, that was his, his, he had a bad habit of just hanging in there because he knew he could to get that punch in, you know? Totally. He could take a, he could take a beating. He had a tremendous chin. Um, good stamina and could hit you know what i mean he would keep on plugging on you andres in that first fight who well, again andres was no like you know perno wetter for defensive defensive guy himself he was a guy that was chucking a lot of leather was beating the living daylights out of andre um out of harding in that first fight just pummeling it but hard like you know he soon enough started running out of gas started getting tired and i you know I'm harding who like i said was just a tough tough dude kept on coming kept on plugging finally broke through at the end and ended up stopping andres dramatically and that was a big upset back then and got a lot of, you know, and this is the late 80s when, like, Australian, uh, the country of Australia in general was, like, really, like, America's fascination with them was at an all-time high. You know what I mean? You had Crocodile Dundee. You had Men at Work. Um, you had Outback Jack, who was featured in WWF. You know what I mean? You had a lot of cool stuff going on. People were eating Vegemite sandwiches. <laughs> So Harding came at a really good time. You know what I mean? All three of those fights were featured on television. The rematch, same thing, just as dramatic. You know what I mean? Harding this time is beating the hell out of Andres, but it's like a close fight. And then at one point, Andres hurts Harding. And he throws like, I'm going to say, dude, he threw at least 40 to 50 punches. Like if Harding somehow survived that, Andres would have been stopped in the next round because he was, he was, you know, exhausted. But he just comes in there. Just unloading on him, and Harding is like a heavy bag. He's standing there and he's taking it, taking it, taking it. And you're wondering, what the fuck, dude? Is he gonna finally drop? And finally, he just dramatically out of just finally drops. And as you see, as Andres is getting tired himself, drops his hands and he's just like, and Harding finally collapses. And you know that's it. But like, yeah, he's like, I finally got this fucking guy. Yeah, dude. Like after you know. God knows how many rounds of just pummeling him and just like chipping away at a boulder that wasn't moving. I finally dropped him. <laughs> yeah, dude. Incredible trilogy, dude. And I mean, un unfortunately, like the, it's not a, it's not a fantastic reign. And like you, like you said, it's not the, it's not like he's the greatest fighter of all time or anything like that. It's not a long reign. It's not a super deep resume, but just that trilogy alone, dude, that trilogy alone is massive. You know, he, and he also uh, got his title taken away by a clearly past his best Mike McCallum, but even so, the, yeah, but I was going to say, even so bro, a past his best Mike McCallum was still damn good. And this is the early 90s, man. I mean, like McCallum had already had the James Tony fights and stuff like that at this point, but he was still considered an elite practitioner. And Harding, to his credit, I mean, you know, he hung in there with McCallum. Sure, he was, you know, more or less outclassed and dominated, but he tongue tough. He landed some good punches and made it a fun fight. He made all of his fights fun because that was Harding. He was just one of those dudes that was always in fun fights. I believe one of his title fights, too, before that was an all out back and forth war that lasted in like two rounds. Actually, I should bring it up on Box Rec because I'm just curious what, what the guy. Um... Yeah, Jeff dude. He, Harding. Yeah. yeah, he only had like 24 or 25 fights yeah, or something not like a that. Lot of fights, yep. Yeah, he didn't have a whole ton of fights. But, you know, he, he got that Kristoff Tiazo under his belt. You know, he, like I said, he didn't have a whole ton of, he didn't have a super deep resume. But 
what's there is pretty high quality, was, at least in terms Tom of entertainment Collins, value. Tom Collins, 24 and 15. And it's only two rounds this fight, but it's an awesome fight. Like Harding is usually, you know, isn't bombarding himself and about to stop him. And then Collins in round two, free swinging himself, lands a massive shot that hurt Harding badly and cut him. And then Collins went for the finish. Um, but Harding responded, you know, beat him up some more. And then at the, at the end of round three, Collins just quit. Like at the end of round two, before round three even started, he was just, he was done. <laughs> but there was literally no science to that fight. It was two guys just going in there and having a bar brawl. Yeah. Um, Nigel Ben has like five of those fights where they're just like one or two or three rounds and just yeah. absolute vicious brutality mayhem. with some just, fucking scrub. Like, you know, with mayhem. Yeah. <laughs> just absolute, just fucking Lee Le Cicero for like six and a half minutes. But no it's reason. like some dude you've never he heard just of. Lasted in half a second total. <laughs> even even in a couple of his title fights, I'm not talking about the Gerald McClellan one. Or like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, ones of the ilk, but like guy, you know, I think the guy's name was like Danny Sanchez or something like that. And like, he, you know, a dude who had no business being in the ring with someone that's supposed to be elite like Ben, and Ben over there getting wobbled across the ring or getting fighting Vincenzo Nardiello, same <laughs> thing, like. He, you know, he just never knew. All you had to do was catch him flush once and you would do a jig and then all of a sudden people would lose it and some guy that was just like, wait, did I just do that with my own shit? And then try to swing on him. Yeah, and then you'd ben go to him. attack him. But then the next thing you knew, it was like he'd go from dead to fucking, ah, like fucking, yeah. you know, mauling you in a half second. It's totally. Fucking and then you just lay in there spread eagled again, looking at the stars, wondering what the hell just happened. <laughs> it sounds like my high, me in high school. Anyway. Oh, oh. what was us? Did you take else? Yeah, dude. So speaking of which, uh -oh. <laughs> no, not speaking of which at all. I just needed. I took, I took my L's in the gym, bro. It was one time I, I sparring this dude used to whip my ass every day and I hit him with a right hand that like busted his nose finally. And I kind of looked at myself like, oh my God, I did. Uh, like I did this to him. <laughs> and when I charged in, he looked like Dame Wayne's in great white hype like oh you're trying to make me look bad on tv yeah basically he got very very annoyed that i had to turn I, that i had the nerve to hit him and yeah you inconvenienced like, me bro yeah yeah like you know the nerve of me how dare you aris and then he proceeded bro to give me the worst ass whooping i've ever received in my life bro like he beat me on every corner of the ring and then trainers did nothing they just let it kind of go on and like i don't know if they wanted to toughen me up what it was but every time he would beat me he would hold up slightly and then beat me even worse Every time I swung back, he would just like kind of smile and just gleefully crack me with a right hand. <laughs> Fucking nightmare. Jesus. And I couldn't do anything about it. I was like trying, I was too tough for my own good and like, you know, too proud to go down. So I'm just there gritting like a little kid. I'm like... <laughs> yeah, doing what you can, but it's yeah. fucking death. Still have nightmares about that. Fuck that. <laughs> yeah, well. Speaking of nightmares, dude, you know who was a fucking nightmare? The Merrickville Mauler. He was a nightmare, a nightmare to fight because that dude was just on your ass. Jeff Fennick, also oh, yeah. definitely one of the greatest Australian fighters without question. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, I've, you probably have met him. I've never met him, which is kind of weird because he was actually training uh fighters out of the wild card for a few years but um yeah he's around the hall of fame he's, he's visited the hall of fame a few times over there. i bet yeah he seems like somebody who would be uh fun to party with and shit like that <laughs> but in any case the merrickville mauler dude uh definitely easy to see why he would be you know beloved why people would like to go see him a guy in in the ring who pressure 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 dude a lot of punches put you against the ropes and then just beat the shit out of you on the ropes. Uh, that was basically his goal in pretty much every fight. <laughs> That's what he was trying to do. So it's easy to see why that would, you know, speak to people, why people would want to see that. Uh, but that led to him being bantamweight, junior featherweight and featherweight champion, defeating some really good fighters along the way. One of the fighters that, I mean, like I almost kind of wish he would have, that he would have, uh, I wish this fighter would have accomplished a little bit more in boxing just because I think it's cool as fuck, but one of the greatest Muay Thai practitioners of all time, Samart yes. Payakaroon. Yeah. Yeah. Bad like, Mama Jamma. 
a really good fighter, but just didn't stick around in boxing quite long enough to have a real long resume. And he was but the none- first guy to drop Fennec. But yeah, nonetheless, Fennec, and he took it out on him. Yeah, totally. Needless no, to say, Akarum was a was a dude. He had like movie star looks. Um, didn't fight like the typical Thai fighter, like really, really, you know, elegant, good fighter. And he absolutely broke Molly Wap, poor um, Lupe Pintor for the belt, which is probably for the best because imagine what a Fennec would have done to poor Pintor at that. Oh, point. yeah, he man, totally that would have been him. ugly. Yeah, that would have been really bad. Um, but yeah, dude, like, not, you know, you, one of those guys, man, he was, dude, Fennec was a beast, an absolute monster. Um, who wasn't featured prominently on American television in the, you know, in the 80s. Because, like, again, you had a, a whole other world going on out there that, you know, a guy that was uh, from Bantamweight to Junior Featherweight up to Featherweight or whatever, Junior Lightweight, like, no one was really trying to feature, especially if you were not from America. Fennec didn't need that, though. He was in Australia. You know, he's a massive, massive star over there. Um, he's sponsored by Reebok, which was really huge at the time, and just – selling out stadiums beating the living daylights out of anyone that was yeah he was so popular down there dude totally and again like you mentioned with his resume bro like his first world title fight was a guy again was um was against a guy named satoshi shing um shingaki i'm totally butchering his name here yeah satoshi shingaki shingaki totally you know that's kind of like a davy moore when when he won his first belt against takashi um so you know, one of those guys that, like, even though you only have a few pro fights, it's not a big deal if you're able to beat him because you're already at levels above that. You're just winning a title now. But now, now that you're a champion after only a few four, a few fights, instantly you're elevated to fight bigger and tougher fights. But to his credit, man, like, he jumped up and he was able to do that. Jerome Kofi, for instance, was total was undefeated. Fenix uh, thrashed him for a, for a decision. Daniel Zaragoza. Um, yep. the hall of famer and one of the you know extremely underrated for mexican legends um fennec was dominating him before the fight ended um for a decision steve mccrory you know what i mean undefeated. yeah also undefeated yeah old medalist a bad bad dude gold 1984 gold medalist from that fabled team um it's probably favored to beat fennec for that belt because you know again fennec was more or less unknown in the u.s mccrory wasn't that dude was even though he had 11 pro fights the fact that they were trying to put him on with Fennec right there thought that they would be an easy victory. Yep. And, he went. and dude, Fennec beat the shit out of him in that fight. I've watched that one and like it's on YouTube. Yeah, he dominated yeah, him and it just was bad. Put a that whooping was on him. Really, really, really bad. And Emmanuel Stewart, who was um, McCrory's trainer, because the you know the whole Kronk thing, um, said too when he ended up training Fennec for his comeback in the in the mid nineties. He was like the first time he ever saw Fennec was when he when he fought Steve and he said he almost killed Steve like it was bad, you know. And McCrory came in there very very confident. If you watch the beginning of the fight, he's in there, he's smiling, he's talking shit, he's laughing and all that. When he gets introduced to the crowd and the crowd absolutely boos the hell out of him the way they're gonna boo Haney this weekend, McCrory sits there and laughs like a villain. And he's sitting there, <laughs> and he's just taking it like it's nothing. And when he went out that first round, he has confidence thinking he's gonna whoop him and. Fennec was just a beast, dude. He, he was like a like a Rottweiler, whatever you want to call it, a grizzly bear. The dude just jumps on you. And not only does he jump on you, he's stronger than you. He had immense physical strength for his division. Um, could hit hard enough that, like, really, you know, to hurt you. And he just didn't stop. There was nothing you could do to take him off you. He was going to stronger than you. He was going to beat the shit out of you. And you just had to take it until you just either went to distance and got half of your career taken away because of it. Or you just got, you know, were stopped or got knocked out. The only drawback to Fennec, and if he didn't have this issue, he probably would have went down as an all-time great, was his hands. He had some of the most brittle hands you can imagine, and they constantly broke, and he had surgery on them all the time, and it really hindered his career for a while. Yeah, he messed up his hands far too many times. And finally, in 1987, when they put him in with somebody where they were like, the only way to, where you were going to get like him to stop was to hurt him and to stop him in his tracks, and nobody could do it. And so they put him in with uh, Zarate, you know, they put him in with Carlos Zarate, who was a puncher, obviously thinking, all right, well, we're going to get something out of this and that they wound up uh, clashing heads just because, you know, aggressive guy against aggressive guy and what it happens. And well, was, so I was shaping up to be a good fight. Zarate was clearly past it at that point. Totally. Um, and Fennec was winning the fight, but like Zarate did land a few punches that could have been interesting if there wasn't a headbutt in that. 
Right. Yeah. Like, and he was being a puncher, you know, I'm not trying to like okay. invent some scenario, but the power being the last thing to go, he's a puncher. And so totally. th that was the whole point was trying to get Fennec in there with somebody who could finally, you know, stop him in his tracks because nobody could yet, right. but you know. And those, I mean, before he fought him, he fought Greg Richardson, who went on to become a champion. It was a very, very good fighter. Um, like we mentioned, Pac um, Pacaroon was able to drop him before Fennec completely overwhelmed him and just, you know, like splayed him out. And when he moved up to fight, uh, when he moved up to fight for the um for the featherweight championship again, he didn't fight a cupcake in his first title fight up there. He fought Victor Ke um Kelehes, who, um, in his title fight with uh was it Larry Stecka, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Larry, what, Larry Stecka, he shattered his jaw when he knocked him out. Like you know, Kale oh, and, not, and that's also too. Remember when I put up that video? Yeah, yeah, where he, he comes him, off like, his feet. Uppercut that lifts him completely off his feet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like. Yeah, somebody doing like, it, somebody not named George Foreman doing it is pretty, yeah, pretty totally. fucking crazy. And that crazy. was a wild one because it wasn't just like, oh, yeah, he, you know, kind of put him on his heels. No, bro, he completely lifts him off his feet. The guy goes flying up in the air. Like yeah, that fool looked like he was about to do a power jam or something. Like he had his feet he, like lucky off both of the his ground. Legs, they didn't get broken because the way he fell was like into a yoga position and just <laughs> like that. Yeah, the, yeah, like he was done. Like he was like, holy shit. And somehow and he's they're like trying to- that still though, to his Yeah, credit. they're he's trying to off. like get him to, yeah. Oh my God. But that was yeah. like cartoon shit. But yeah, um, Fennec moved up to fight him and ended up ripping him apart too, man. Like he seemed unstoppable, you know? Um, Marcos Velasana, who was a beast, a guy with an iron jaw, you couldn't knock out. Another dude with a um, incredible- um, uh in, you know what i mean like uh yeah why can't i talk right now like an incredible incredible stamina incredible will tough guy could hit hard wasn't the most skilled guy but just really really rugged and tough same you know fennec out brawled him out dueled him again it wasn't really a close decision mario martinez who gave azuma nelson fits who fought um all kinds of other guys like you know a really really tough guy long time contender from there same thing fennec just whooped him it got to the point and then georgie yeah. navarro even who yeah. who twice fought hector lopez or we just yes. talked about totally same guy you know and it got to there till you know fennec now was moving up to fight for his fourth world championship and this was on the undercard of you know mike tyson against razor ruddick seated in vegas at the mirage outside the sun is setting a beautiful scene all the big celebrities because back in the late 80s early 90s all of them were coming out for tyson fights so you think now what you see with like big stars for big fights, like usually when they mention, you know, they show all the stars in the audience, at least 60% and 75% of them are fighters, right? Oh, all the stars came out. Then you see Errol Spence, you see Crawford and you see this one and that one, maybe Mayweather, a couple other guys. Then you'll see some celebrities too, like people that are big fight fans, but there's usually the majority of fighters at this card right here. I remember you saw Bill Cosby, you saw, um, Jack Nicholson, Tommy Lee, like anyone who was big in Hollywood was that was at that car. All right. And um, Fennec puts on the performance of a lifetime against another all time great in Azuma Nelson. Like just whoops on. I mean, it was a, it was a, like Nelson to his credit, did land some punches too, but Fennec for the most part just gotten dominated it. It wasn't like in near the end of the fight, he had Nelson on the verge of a knockout. Like he was really, really moving on him, man. And like, you know, full full spear just in his chest doing that you know what i mean first time you're really seeing him on showtime and on pay-per-view american audiences are some this is a lot of people's first time seeing fennec in the flesh you just read about him in ring magazine read about him in various magazines maybe seen a you know a highlight clip here and there but this is your first time really watching him and everybody's in awe they're like holy shit man he's nelson is a bad man majama who's been around forever and fennec is just treating him like a rank amateur at this point near the end and then what happens bro what happens boxing happens boxing happens exactly yep. yeah venix trainer was a, an australian boxing staple very famous guy who passed away a handful of years ago named johnny lewis um he had a gym in i think sydney but i'm not positive i'd, I'd have to look it up point being the overall point is that johnny lewis was obviously uh you know a, a very important important guy in Australian boxing, Jeff Fennec comes over and 
does a number on, on Azuma Nelson wins, or at least should win, like, you know, nine, three, eight, four ish. Azuma Nelson, very tough guy to deal with himself, aggressive counter puncher, very, 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 very good jab. Did well early on in the fight, you know, did his thing, but then just, you know, he, it's like he had nothing. Like he, uh, after a handful of rounds, like he was just kind of going through the motions and then started getting whooped on, started getting beat up. And, you know, you had a bout of malaria for that for his performance or whatever, but yeah, for the most I'm, part, he got whooped on. He was yeah. laying on the ropes and Fennec just mauled him. I've mentioned this before, uh, his book. It's a fun book and it's an easy read, but for every single little thing, he's got some sort of funny excuse or like, you know, it anyway, it's it's more funny than like annoying. But in any case, yeah, he claimed there were a handful of things that he took the fight last minute that, you know, uh, there was some misunderstanding about the fight. And then on top of that, that he was sick. Uh, yeah, I mean, anyway, point being, he looked like shit. And toward the end of the fight, he looked really bad. Uh, and then they, for some reason, handed Nelson a draw. I mean, weird to say that because neither guy won, but they handed Nelson a draw. He shouldn't have won. He shouldn't have uh, had a draw. He should have lost that fight very clearly. And, and on top of that, uh, Fennec was pissed. Fennec was like, Fennec, that like fucked him up. He said, like, that he was. Totally. Oh, no, bro. He was, that really screwed him over, man. I mean, imagine this is like your first time really, you know, in, in front of the world like this. Everybody's watching, like, in massive never stage. Had more eyes on him. Massive stage. I mean, sure, he's big in Australia, but this is the whole world watching him for the first time. A lot of people's eyes, like we said. This is the early 90s. It's not like you had YouTube and all these things to catch Fennec footage on there. Unless you were like a hardcore fan that could somehow catch some of his fights, you weren't going to see much of it. So, and all, you know, everything was taking place in Australia. You read about him in Ring Magazine, read about him in KO Magazine. So seeing him for the first time, reading, after reading about him, seeing exactly how he fights is basically translating, you know, right there. And to see him get screwed like that, I mean, that's just deflating. And you were going to make history as a four division world champion. First one to like, you know, like that in Australia, all this shit. I can't even imagine, bro. That's just like taking a, a knife and just shoving it right in your gut and just twisting it. Yeah. Pretty rough, dude. Pretty, pretty nasty stuff. And so, you know, they put him in with Azuma Nelson again, but they bring him down to Melbourne. You know, they, it's a yeah. massive uh, to do. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure that they had broken some records for ticket sales for that fight you know, it was a massive, like, all right, now Jeff, Jeff Fennec, like, he's going to fucking do it this time. Fool's going to fuck him up. You know, he deserves to get the decision last time. It's going to go real bad, blah, blah, blah. And Azuma Nelson just flipped the script on his ass. Just, he, he did his Azuma Nelson thing. <laughs> oh, yeah. poor, poor Fennec, dude, because that was supposed to be his, that was supposed to be it for him. That was supposed to be where he showed everybody what he was made of. And Azuma Nelson, uh, you know, it was a very close fight, but then Azuma Nelson came through in the last two rounds or so and just molly whopped yeah. bad. And Fennec wasn't even himself in that fight. Let's, no. let's be honest. Like, that was not him. He got dropped early, which had the crowd completely shook. Like, like you said, it was a close fight. He did come back. And, you know, Nelson was a guy that's never, especially around this point in like the mid nineties, Azuma Nelson, like he was, a, he was a guy that fought more in spurts than he did in terms of like being super active. So, and in Australia, yeah, it's, it's going to be, a, it would be a close fight. So at the end of the fight, I think two of the judges had, you know, the scores even. And, but no, nah, man, Nelson was being Nelson. Once he had you hurt and he was motivated this time after everyone was saying he was washed and shouldn't have won that fight. Yeah. And he came in with those overhand rights and other fireballs that he threw and Fennec got blasted out. No shame in that. But that also, again, fucked him up. He lost in front of his crowd for the first time. He lost like, he's, you know, completely like disbelieved by that his very next fight is against calvin grove calvin grove a former featherweight champion from the late 80s um tough guy very very good guy very very skilled fighter um but a dude who kind of like had his place in terms of you know that era like yeah, any he was he not really, being brought in to win no no totally not because anytime he had really stepped up to the elite he had lost you know i mean he lost his belt to jorge Paez, and subsequently lost a rematch um, he lost other times he fought for championships. Like, you know, he was a good fighter, but at Saint, like anytime he really fought like the best of the division, he usually would come up short. So he seen, and he wasn't a monster punching himself either. So he seemed like a safe bet for Fennec and, you know, to fight him in Australia. Ugh. Again, dude, that ended up being an absolute disaster. Fennec clearly wasn't himself in that fight again too. Um, Grove 
who had just come off a close loss to Azuma Nelson and was feeling extra motivated himself, um, put on a career best performance and ended up knocking Fennec out violently, violently. Like Fennec was out cold and you see this blood like trickling out of the side of his mouth there and stuff. And the crowd is just kind of like, you know, like completely shocked. And that sent Fennec into retirement for a little bit, but yeah. Um, a very, I mean, he fought a couple more times after that, but it was basically he, he came back because that's what I was going to mention too. Is that you know how I alluded to Emmanuel Stewart earlier? He when he made a comeback around 1995, he brought Emmanuel Stewart in as his head trainer, and Stewart tried to revamp him. I'm not sure if it was the right way to do it, but he tried to. Instead of him being a completely you know walking in, waiting in mauler, um, pressure fighter, he tried to make him a boxer a little bit. Like his first fight was against a journeyman by the name of um, Tito Tovar. And who, again, if you looked up his record, he fought a who's who of whoever it was back then, but always lost. Anyways, but he was dependable. He's a guy that could go rounds. So Fennec, I think Stewart said it too, that like after a few rounds, Fennec went back to his corner and said, I'm fucking bored. What am I doing? Because Stewart had him just boxing, like jabbing, jabbing, trying to like, you know, pick his punches and stuff like that. Because he wanted Fennec to get rounds. He wanted him to, you know, to, to work and, try to like incorporate something new. And Fennec was like, I don't like this. I don't want to do this. But he ended up scoring a stoppage, right? And he ended up having another win after that. And soon enough, he got planted right into a title fight by a rampaging guy at the point at this point who had a work rate like a prime Fennec, Philip Holiday. And they convinced Holiday to go to Australia for this. Holiday was promoted by Cedric Kushner. So I know Cedric saw a big payday when he saw one. He was like, oh yeah, easy work. And Holiday, who at that time was a completely unknown champion, but this fight probably propelled him into the Ivan Robinson fight on HBO, thrashed Fennec. It was an absolute massacre. And, you know, Fennec had no business being in the title fight at that point. And it lasted two rounds. Fennec got dropped a bunch of times, and that was it. And then finally, after that, they held a fight. <laughs> they... Oh, God. Yeah. With Azuma Nelson. <laughs> yeah. Where Azuma Nelson claimed that, that, uh, he was told that before he went to Australia that it was supposed to be an exhibition. Yep. And then by the time he got there, they said, no, no, it's a real fight. And then he was like, fuck that. You know, you're not paying me for a real fight. But then there was a big haggle about money. And I mean, you know, <laughs> I don't I don't know how serious you take any of this, to be honest. But, you know, it, they tried this to fight. I mean, Nelson was all great and fading. Fennec had no business being in there, but like, you know how you alluded to it completely messed him up with that first Nelson fight. Like, this was like something he had to like. Yeah, he couldn't up. let it go. He couldn't let it go. He just needed to get the. He needed to get that W back and just like run out. You know, finally yeah, find some th decent life. This is this is Ray Leonard, thirty years on, having a fucking thirty for thirty, where they're getting in Roberto Duran's face and trying to make him admit. <laughs> that the reason why you, you didn't really beat me or so, whatever he was saying that was like so bizarre i will never forget that that was the and roberto duran's looking at him like what the fuck are you talking about right now bro they had a face off he's like roberto you never explain what really went on that day right and they and you hear the dramatic music when you see them both staring at each other like what the hell was that bro i He's you know, so weird. 30 for 30s, like that one, the fucking weird spoken word one for, for Tyson and Tupac. Um, it was so weird, bro. Yeah, they've had some, well, in any case, yeah. It's, it's the Larry very, Holmes Muhammad Ali one was very good, though. You no, know, they've had some really good ones, but a couple of them have been head scratchers, and that one didn't make any sense to me. But that's kind of how I read it was, you know, Fennec just could not let this shit go. Uh, you know, the fact that he should have had that first win and then when he came to get the second win, he got his ass kicked. That's, you know, that's, that's a tough pill to swallow. But you also, like we've talked about, dude, he'd already gone through a full career's worth of shit by then. You know, he'd already, he'd already accomplished a lot. And so mm -hmm. by that time, it, it felt like to a lot of American audiences who were the first, seeing him <laughs> for the first time, like he was a bust, like he was a nobody or something, when that was not the case. It was like, it's like Nassim Hamed, you know, when American audiences were, they didn't see him for the first time against Barrera, but that was the first big fight. And so now any time it's like, well, Barrera kicked his ass, told you he's a nobody. Look and at all those stupid comments you had in the boxing history page the other day. It's just how it goes oh, yeah, every Barrera single time. Beat him, Barrera beat him, yeah, oh, and it's. And it's not to the same degree, Overrated. obviously, with Overrated. Fennec, but, yeah. you know, similarly. But, I mean, you know, Fennec has had a rough time. Like, he, he's had some out-of-the-ring troubles. 
Um, he's, you know, had tough, like trying to keep himself up, but for the most part, he seems like he, you know, he's, he's happy, he's healthy and he's content. And he's a damn good trainer too. He's, he's then, he's been, um, very active in the, in the Australian boxing scene, yep. the environment, still immensely popular. And yeah, he has, a, I'm, I'm not sure if he's still with her, but he had one of the most stunning wives I've ever seen too at the boxing hall. <laughs> I, I, I have heard of her. So, so, so yeah so yes i would probably because i've you know, heard I mean, of her. i'm talking the early 2000s bro like <laughs> me and my best friend used to see Susie fennick terry norris's wife at the time her name was amy and paulie ayala's wife and they all used to just kind of like clink click together because that's you know ayala was obviously popular back then so you see him at the hall of fame norris same thing he was a staple even before he got inducted and um yeah fennick when he got inducted he brought her along so like you see them and you just kind of like <laughs> I believe it. Yeah. I believe it. They, well, they were they were incredible. My friend took a photo. He he asked to take a photo with Amy one time, Amy Norris. And she was like, Oh, do you want Terry in it too? And Terry walked over. And my friend looked at him disdainfully and went, I guess. <laughs> he's like, Yeah, whatever, fine. I yeah. guess so. Let's see. It was another person I wanted to or or actually somebody else you need to get in there. Are, are there any other Australian fighters that you're like, yo? Well, I mean, you know, you know, let's bring up someone that might be a little bit more obscure for the people, I guess, right? Um, well, not not so much obscure, but um, someone that I just feel like talking about really briefly because he had one of the most wildest title fights in history, um, Jimmy Crothers. <laughs> Yeah, dude, that's, you know, even just for that one fight alone, he's worth bringing up. Um, he actually figures in fairly prominently to the history of the old tin shed, Sydney Stadium, because he fought in Sydney Stadium a lot um, in the 1950s. And so he was very familiar to the people around Sydney. And he was as a world champion. And also uh, he was the Australian champion, too. Um, you know, he was popular. He was fairly popular. And so, yeah, Jimmy Crothers definitely should be up there without question. Totally. And, you know, the fight I'm referencing is, um, is against, um, pronounce his name for me, bro, because you know I'm bad at these. Chamron Songkit Rat. There we go. Chamron Songkit Rat. And mm -hmm. fight took place in Thailand. First title fight in Thailand. This was the, basically them just, like, dipping their feet in boxing for the first time. And um, Chamron was a former kickboxing, you know, Muay Thai guy that converted into boxing. And tough guy, you know, by all accounts, he very, very tough guy, very strong guy. Um, fought, you know, a few of the, the prominent fighters from that era, like him, Raul Rojas, and a, and a couple others. But, like, what makes this fight so incredible and so, like, kind of fascinating is that there was a – it was fight was held outside, you know, in a, in a big open-air stadium. And – ton you know everybody was there huge huge crowd to see you know hopefully the coronation of um son kit track and a giant rainstorm ends up breaking out like a huge huge tropical storm which you know tends to happen out there but <laughs> because of it happening you know this is the middle of a boxing match and so what they ended up doing was they ended up fighting shoeless and there's famous photos of them you can see the puddles in the ring and you see the rain coming down and there's like a photo, for instance, you see Crothers going for an uppercut with it, you know, <laughs> with his feet like in position to throw one. You see like the momentum of it, but he's he has no shoes on it. It's just kind of fascinating. You see him in puddles doing this, and you see Chamron kind of because I was getting he was a crude guy. You see him wide open, I guess, wide open for the uppercut. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, he's well, like, yeah, and he, he looks like that. He like has his hands wide open. I don't know what he's trying to do. But Crothers is about to come in with an uppercut, and you just see, you're like, holy shit, they're actually fighting in the rain. <laughs> yeah, barefoot. Yeah, barefoot. Yeah, that's what's in, that's the famous photo. Um, I've looked to try to find better photos and stuff like that. I'm sure there are some out there, but just not not online that I can see. Um, but yeah, that that alone, that fight alone, fucking wild that it would be. I mean, hearkening back to we've talked uh, before about bare knuckle days where fights were held out in fields or on estates and barns, et cetera, where, you know, these far flung places where you'd need boots or some shit to go fight. And um, you know, it, those days were supposed to be over. <laughs> You're mm -hmm. supposed to be fighting in 
comfortable shoes in a stadium or something like that. Was, so they did fight in a stadium, but like you said, there was a monsoon during the time and it was so bad that it was knocking the lights off of the light fixtures. And they were concerned that people were going to start getting electrocuted ringside yep. because it was so or bad. All the glass that was going to start breaking from the bulbs and different things falling into the ring. They're going to have to, you know, yeah, they had to clear the ring. I think it a few different times. Looking, you know what? End up looking like it was going to end up looking like fucking kickboxer with Van Dam fought on. Yeah. <laughs> it was, it's going to wind up looking Black, like one of them steel cage matches where yeah, shit's Black just thrown into all the over ring. The place, all these other things, them and their barefoot. <laughs> just, you know. Yeah, knock cow. Knock yeah, cow. Okay. That's probably what um, they were chanting at Jimmy Crothers, dude. Crothers was a cow. bad mamma jammer, bro. Like he, you know, he knocked out Vic Tauliu. Um, Tauliu. Who was yep. a undefeated South African champion? Yeah, Back first South Africa. African champion. Yeah, first yeah. African champion beat um beat um uh, Manuel Manuel. Uh, give me his last name here. One of the one of the great Manuel Ortiz. Excuse me. Yeah, beat Manuel Ortiz for the for the bantamweight championship. Overall, really really tough guy. Crothers washed him in a round, which was like really impressive. And he did that in, in Johannesburg and in enemy territory. Then went he- back in Johannesburg and beat him again. And something that I'm sure you would probably have a special, you know, appreciation for is that he threw over a hundred punches in like I think it was either just under or just over two minutes. That's to, insane. To stop Vic Tawil. Like he because he did he wasn't a big puncher. He was he was like an okay puncher. He mm-hmm. was more of a boxer and a stylist, but he just was like bah, 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 you know, just fucking nonstop punching to stop Vic Tawil, you know, South Africa's first world champion. And he was, you know, somewhat popular himself. And I think that he was, oh man, I can't remember what he was. He was like Tunisian or something like that. I can't remember exactly where he was from, like ethnically, but he was from South Africa. But um, another guy, and this is a name that some people who like the true crime episodes of the show might want to pay attention to because I've been brainstorming. He also defeated a dude named Pappy Galt. Mm-hmm. who was shot and killed uh and so that's what i'm saying we might be revisiting that name at some point in the future but he defeated uh, his second defense after defeating vic tawil in his first defense again uh was a guy named pappy galt that he beat and then that then came the chamron Songkit rut uh fight and he retired after that fight pretty soon after that fight he relinquished the title and he made a comeback like 10 years later or something like that. Got his ass kicked a few times. Yeah. yeah, it did not do very well. But he was for a while definitely one of Australia's more popular champions. I mean, well, one of their only champions at that point, but nonetheless, a popular guy, a popular fighter totally. for sure. Yeah, and one that I wanted to bring up, he's not a guy that gets brought up a lot in like history or, you know, he's kind of forgotten about. He's... Vic Tawil is forgotten about a lot of those people from that era. You know, you go so far back that just they just you know, unless you're nuts like us and really want to dig into the history, they're just in books now. You know, there's a little bit of footage of them out there, but they're mostly in books. That's what it is. And if you want to dig into it and find their career and everything, then you know. But him, excuse me. And <laughs> since we brought up fighting Harada earlier, um, Harada, you know, this wasn't his only touch with um, Australian boxing history. He also had a you know a series with another um, great Australian fighter, transplant at that Johnny Famichon. That's right, Johnny Famichon was a Frenchman who you know emigrated to Australia, but was definitely Australian. You know, was oh. definitely taken in. I've been reminded that a few times when I've posted about <laughs> posted about him on Boxing History. I've been like, you know so-and-so from france and i've had a couple of australians be like he was he was australian dude don't be an ass and i'm like my bad <laughs> shit all right so obviously the australians are claiming him uh but a very very good fighter a uh, very popular guy he uh, right around that time you know gained in popularity a little bit a little bit more mainstream than the other fighters had to that point yeah and a very very good fighter, man. Like it was a it was his brother Ray. His brother was Ray Famichon, right? Gosh, I hope so because I've thought so for a long time. Or was it his uncle? Like is either an uncle? Or, or yeah, I, th- I think there was some other slightly more distant relation, like uh, uncle or cousin or some shit. Yeah. But he fought that. You know, he fought Willie Pep for the championship. Mm-hmm. Like they, had, you know, it was a fighting history with him. But um, he was able. You know, he was able to beat incredibly underrated Jose Allegra for the championship. 
and Legra is another guy that's kind of been lost in history or whatever, but just yeah, you, know, you and I have talked about him more than once. But dude, I mean, you know, a Cuban who um, ended up in Miami, um, trained alongside, you know, with Angelo Dundee, trained alongside uh, Luis Rodriguez and others, just incredible fighter, really, you know, gorgeous to watch, very, very tough, but kind of got on the um, unfortunately, he, he was on the short end of the stick of uh, a lot of decisions, you know, very, very close fights, but you know, that's where he ended up. Anyways, um, the fights what I was going to bring up was this two-fight series with Fighting Karata. Because, you know, like, the first one was one of the, is known as one of the most controversial fights in featherweight, you know, in featherweight history, if not just in boxing. Like, a fight that, you know, Harada was moving up to, um, to make history again to become um, a three-time world champion, triple division champion. And when he fought Famichin for the title, which was in, this was in 1969, uh, by all accounts, Harada should have won that fight. Like, you know, he he really put it on Famichin. The fight was held in Sydney. Very, you know, Famichin, didn't, don't get me wrong. He, you know, he did pretty well too. But Harada, by all accounts, got the better of it. Like, clearly won the fight. It wasn't really that close. And Willie Pep, former champion, referee, and the sole judge of the fight, scored it for Famichin by one point, which caused an uproar. And yep. kind of also too, you know, quells in the question, former champions who had a, 200 bout careers or whatever what are they doing scoring fights and being referees but. well and <clears throat> excuse me right around this time i'm not i'm not saying that this is why but right around this time willie pep had actually written a book and so he was going on a little bit of a world tour promoting the book yep and so like for instance he had muhammad ali kind of helping him promote it a little bit in a couple cities um, and I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm not saying that this is why, but in any case, uh, yeah, this was right around the same time of his book. So I'm not surprised that he would have gotten kind of like this celebrity refereeing gig as it were, but Johnny Famichon was down like several times in the fight fighting Harada was beating him up, you know, all over the place. This was in the Sydney stadium that I was just talking about a few minutes ago, big fight, fighting Harada, one of the greatest uh, Japanese fighters of all time. And even Willie Pep admitted later on that he fucked up, that he fucked it up, that he didn't score it the way that he should have. And he didn't know what he was doing more or less. So I mean, like it shouldn't have gone right. the way that it went. Call him the white Jersey Joe Walcott, right? Oh my gosh, dude. Man, <laughs> I'm, just, I mean, I'm joking, but like, no, that was a really big thing. Really? And then years later, I remember when Harada got inducted into the hall of fame, um, Willie Pep was there as well, and someone brought up, "Hey, you want to go see Pep or something like that?" And Harada was like, "Yeah, I'm good." <laughs> yeah, he's like, "Oh, respectfully, fuck that guy." <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they were like, "Yeah, neither one sunk, yeah, seek the other one out that week," and they kind of avoid each other. Yeah, <laughs> pass, but, fucking pass. But to his credit, to his credit, they did have a rematch, and he ended up stopping Harada and, fin and retiring him. Yeah. So, well, at least he righted that wrong. You know, yeah. at least he it was a pretty big uh wrong to write but yeah at least and not only that wrong. he went to japan to do it like he you know harada came to australia to beat him and then famichin traveled to harada's background and dominated him yeah you ain't gonna see that too many times no. these days yeah. so and again you know after that like his um he did be um i'm noticing this now he um he did be uh I, I didn't even realize this. He beat Arnold Taylor, who is a part of one of the greatest bantamweight fights in history, against um, Romeo Anyanya by decision. Before his last fight was against another dude who we mentioned, the incredibly underrated Vicente Saldivar, yep. who was making a comeback at that point. Um, yeah, one and one of the underrated comebacks as far as you know the title comeback of uh, yeah, and like, Ader Joffre Saldivar. Those that's you know among the, group, the better yeah, comebacks. Totally. Saldivar was, dude, an absolute beast. And I mean, for him to come back and whoop on Famichin the way he was able to do. I mean, he didn't, his, 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 quote, his second comeback didn't last that long. Like, you know, soon after beating um, Famichin, he ended up losing, he ended up losing the title. And by a stoppage to, um, I think it was uh, Kuniaki Shibata. Mm -hmm. And after losing to him, you know, then he fought at a Joffrey in a battle of like, you know, kind of like, you know, guys a little bit past their best, but two of the best of their generation ended up being all-time greats themselves, and Joffrey stopped them. Yep. All-time great fighter himself. Yeah. Yeah, dude, Johnny Famichon's a good one, for sure. And I mean, we're, and because 
Australia is not overflowing with tons and tons of world-class fighters the way that some other countries are. And that's not to talk down on it whatsoever. Mm. Um, boxing has not latched on there the way that it has other places. It's mostly kind of gone in waves. So like we're kind of running low on fighters, but there is somebody that I did want to talk about who I mentioned earlier, because I feel like it's important to talk about not only him, but uh, fighters like him who comprise a very important part of Australia's boxing history, but they are going to routinely get shortchanged and not talked about the way that they should and remember the way that they should. Uh, this is something I learned about, I don't know, perhaps maybe nine or 10 years ago, uh, because I didn't really know very much about it. Even now, my, in my knowledge as far as Australia boxing history is pretty lacking, but I'm trying. And, um, you know, Alex McClintock, who is a writer, he doesn't really write too much about boxing anymore. And I don't really see him writing in general that much anymore overall. But nonetheless, he wrote a really good piece for the Queensbury Rules about tent boxing uh, in Australia. And basically, to sum up, tent boxing was indigenous Australians were often, when they were fairly young, uh, placed in these kind of traveling circuses, um, which is, for <laughs> anybody who's listened to our history episodes, not unfamiliar, the kind of traveling fighting circus or exhibition thing is not something that, you know, that you, you'd probably be familiar with that, especially with uh, British boxing history, the boxing booths and stuff like that. Uh, similarly, a lot of these young indigenous fighters would be pitted against one another in these tent fights and stuff like that traveling around uh, Australia. And so one of these fighters, so this kind of history with these indigenous Australians in boxing was going on concurrently, simultaneously, as the, the early history of like the Sydney Stadium, even a little bit before that. So this guy that I wanted to talk about, Jerry Jerome, a lot of the research into him and into his life was actually done by a number of indigenous Australians who work for the Australian government and libraries currently. Um, so I, I got to give them a shout because this is not me. This is not my work. And the, one of the last fucking things that I would ever want to do when talking about and trying to honor indigenous people is to steal the fucking work of indigenous people myself. That would be awful. So I got to give them some credit. They've done a lot of research. So in the U.S., a lot of people know about club shows. You know, they talk about their fight shows and fight cards that aren't that big. They're probably a lot more difficult to pull off now with the pandemic and shit like that. We were talking about this earlier with pay-per-views and all that type of stuff in the business of boxing, blah, blah, blah. A lot of indigenous people in Australia fought on basically, like I said, carnival circuits. And so that's a lot of these fighters are really unsung. Uh, probably the majority of fighters overall in boxing history are pretty unsung, but it's pretty difficult to imagine actually fighting in like, you know, a literal circus tent and shit like that. It's pretty wild. So this guy, Jerry Jerome, he was born in a place called, uh, in Australia called Jimboor Station, which is literally just like pastoral land fields and stuff like that. Uh, some uh, uh, places in Australia are famous for their sheep meat or cow meat, uh, there are a lot of shepherds in some of these areas, but unfortunately, indigenous Australians, uh, there's a history of, of indigenous Australians being exploited for labor in these parts. And this is where Jerry Jerome was from. He was of the uh, indigenous Iman people. And so unfortunately, again, it's there's a lot of sadness to these stories, but smallpox killed off about half of the Iman people when white people first got there. And then the rest were often worked to death after white people got there, basically. And after the government had been set up by the British crown, there was literally a position in place called the chief protector of indigenous peoples or a chief protector of Aborigines. They literally had to go to this person to ask if they could get married, if they could move, if they could make business deals, et cetera. I mean, it was awful. But the point being, and the why I bring that up, is Jerry Jerome was somebody who was known to be like a troublemaker among a lot of the indigenous peoples. Like, in the, you know, we look back now and it's kind of like in a playful way, he was just do shit that he was not following the rules. But when he was 34 years old, he had actually started boxing so that he could get new farming equipment. 
He didn't start boxing because he wanted to be a fighter. He didn't start boxing because he wanted fame or anything like that. He needed new equipment. And so he boxed because he could get money for new equipment, which is what he did at 34 years old. And he actually wound up fighting his way to being the first indigenous Australian to win the uh, to win an Australian uh, title, not a world title, but an Australian title. He even fought his way to in 1913 headlining against Ercole de Balsac, you know, that French dude the probably probably read his name just because his last name is fucking ball sack. What the fuck you guys, but sorry, he headlined against this dude at Sydney stadium, which is massive because Sydney stadium is just getting really big. It just got a brand new roof in 1912 or 13 and Jerry Jerome, indigenous Australian headlining at Sydney, Sydney stadium. That's pretty massive dude. So in any case, uh, he had a really strange style. There's actually a video of him up on YouTube. He looks like Emmanuel Augustus dude. He's moving around the ring all crazy, like this weird, like funky style with a weird rhythm. And so anyway, uh, over the course of just a few years, he fought like 50 or 60 times had far more success than he really had any business having whatsoever. Most of the photos of him are of him in traditional indigenous garb, which is not much at all. It's literally just like a grass and straw covering his, you know, his parts. And that's about it. But also one of the really fun things and awesome things that I fucking loved when finding this research was that there were photos of him driving it around in a car, which he was not supposed to be doing, according to the chief protector of Aborigines at the time. And he did it anyway, because he was like, fuck you guys. And it's basically like the indigenous Australian version of Jack Johnson, like being like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fuck you, dude. <laughs> Just driving around in a fucking car. It's awesome. Here's a so, hundred bucks. Why? Oh, because I have to come back this way. That's the story, you know? But that's yeah. anyway, he uh he actually fought a number of times uh in fairly big stadiums around Australia. He fought a dude named Arthur Cripps, who was a, a big uh a pretty popular fighter in Australia at the time, he made almost $500,000, which is almost just absolutely unheard of around this time, especially for an indigenous person, but he squandered it away, either giving it away, partying, driving around, fucking around. Cause he just did. Cause he didn't, you know, he was just like I'm living. Yeah, bro. He's I'm living. So anyway, um, I don't really have I any grand. People, I just want to be living. Yeah, man. I don't have any grand, you know, lesson I mean, look, about I this. I don't have money. I don't have what you know. What um, you remember the uh, million dollar man's bodyguard Virgil? What yeah. he calls what he calls fuck money. I, I don't. I don't have stuff like that. Like money, I can just kind of throw away and do whatever. But well, you know, this... people that can't. You want to live and do what you want with your with your dough. Go for it, man. You want to be living like that? I mean, you know, might well, not be the best way to live, but hey. Whatever. And, you know, there's no real like, unfortunately, there's no happy ending or moral to the story because Jerry Jerome, uh, he fucked off all of his money and the government actually went after him because he was not spending his money how I guess they wanted him to spend it. Okay. And so he got locked up. He got relocated forcibly. And he unfortunately wound up dying alone and poor at a mission for indigenous people. Uh, and anyway, like I said, no real moral, not a happy ending, but very, very, very much worth remembering this dude, Jerry Jerome, because he was one of the early, earliest, uh, practitioners of professional boxing in indigenous Australia. I mean, considering that would be a person I was never going to bring up today. So I'm, I'm glad you did. That's what we're, that's what we're known for the obscurities for sure. And I mean, like I said, the list is dwindling very short. No, 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 it is, man. And like at this point that we've gone through so many, I'm just going to pile in a few that. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Please do. Like we've, you know, you have Dave Sands, for instance, who um, never became world champion, but you can kind of consider him Australia's version of um, Salvador Sanchez or um, Masao Oba, for instance. You know, and like another that. indigenous Australian that, yeah. Yeah. Died in a car accident. Um was hope to fight you know great great fighter in himself man probably would have been a world champion came had, from a fighting a family of, he had like five or six brothers that are all fighters too from, i mean had a ridiculous record himself a full career that most people wouldn't even see today you know over, close to 100 fights or so but um yeah was a person that should be mentioned um and I, there's a lot more to say about him but i'm just kind of condensing it here yeah 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 you know i mean you have like who i brought up before the show um you know there's a lot of guys that get transplanted from other countries that end up in there you have another one, Rocky uh, Maccioli. 
who mm-hmm. was an Italian former junior middleweight champion, ended up in Australia, very immensely popular. I think he might still be living there today. Um, Joe Bugner, you know, originally from England, ended up moving to Australia in the 80s, affectionately known as Aussie Joe now. Um, one of our favorites, who we always talk about, Vic Darchinian, another one who, you know, Armenian, who now became, became an Australian. Um, I love Darchinian. You do. He, he's just a scrappy dude, man. He's a, he's a goon. He's absolutely I didn't at the time, but now I do. Exactly. Yeah, totally. like at the time, I was like, that fucking guy, but now I love Yeah, him. yeah, yeah. Es- especially in his first title reign when he was beating people up and just being an absolute goon bag. <laughs> he was everyone. a terror. And then, and then um, Donair just flattened him. And I was so happy when Donair flattened yeah, him. Yeah, that was ba- that was big. I, was, I, I just started at Showtime. I had just started at Showtime, fresh out of college. And that was the first fight that we were working on. And we were doing so many promo videos, just strictly concentrating on Garcini and blasting people and beating up Dorneo's um, poor brother, Glenn, because that was the storyline for the fight. That, like, we were just concentrating on that. That no one, Dorneo was a complete afterthought. No one thought that Dorneo had a shot in hell. I remember that shit. Nobody did. And when he got flattened the way he did, bro, I remember that Monday, people were back in the office and they were just kind of like, bro. What happened? <laughs> and, and I remember people, and I remember uh, Jim Gray shoving his microphone in Darchinian's face. And I'm just like, he's so concussed. And he's just like, well, fine. You know, he, he, he didn't give me a count. He didn't count or something like that. And yeah, I remember yeah, just yeah. thinking, get him out of there. Get him to the hospital right now. But I mean, I ended up respecting the hell out of him because he literally would fight anybody, anytime, any place. And he would always put up a good performance, man. Like he was beating Donaire in the rematch and beating him pretty convincingly. He but he was. can't get away from a left hook. Whatever, yeah, that's his kryptonite. And right when I, I like, I was cheering for him in that fight. I was doing punch zone, and I was like, "Oh no, Vic, watch out!" <laughs> yeah, dude, he <laughs> saw it from like two miles away. It was you, like, I just, no. we all saw it, man. Donnie was hurt. I was like, "No, watch out, God, here it goes." <laughs> you just like, you know, God damn it, Vic, you were this close. You yeah, had him. Poor, poor fellow, you were right there. <laughs> Uh, yeah. You know, and, but uh, yeah, I respect the hell of him because he would. I mean, look at he fought Nicholas Walters, right? And Walters was a giant ass featherweight. You saw how big that dude is. He's a beast. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, what happened to that guy, bro? But yeah, go ahead. But absolute monster. You know what I mean? And uh, two times the size of Darchinian. And Vic still fought him, you know, and went in on him. But, um, so that was another one you had to mention him. Lester Ellis, a former world champion. Um, Barry Michael. That's, you know, people that are boxing fans in the 80s. That's an obscure name. That's a good one, um, yeah. And then also probably the consensus for the best Australian fighter in history, Foster Zoo. Totally. The, the thunder from down under. I don't yeah. know why they started calling him that. That was a bad nickname, you guys. Very, very bad, stupid nickname. But That's I mean, bad. Zoo Zoo was that dude. Yeah. And you know, to, to bring the, the, the broach, like really quick to go back to Nelson Fennec too. I remember reading the Ring Magazine article from when, when they were covering, the, whoever was covering Fennec Nelson too went there to cover it live. And they were telling him, hey, yeah, yeah, you know, Fennec this and that, whatever. But bro, you got to see the person on the undercard. Oh, who are you talking about? This kid cost a zoo, man. You got, you don't understand. He is going to be a future superstar world champion, yada, 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 yada. Oh, that's nice. Oh, I'm sure he is, man. So when can I see Fennec? Like, that's how they're thinking about it. You know what I mean? And then yep. Zoo blasts out his opponent and people caught notice and they're like, wait, whoa, hold up here. Well, hold and, up, and Fennec would have known too because they were in the same gym. Johnny Lewis yeah, trained, yeah, yeah. People trained knew, Zoo right? too. And look what Zoo ended up doing. You know, and, and the thing is too, is that like, you got to remember when Zoo, well, considering today's the anniversary of the fight, when Zoo got knocked out by Vince Phillips, people started writing him off completely, you know? Like, they thought, oh, this was a flash in the pan. Phillips, you know, it was a hell of a fight. Don't get me wrong. Phillips had to overcome an immensely badly cut eye. He, um, bombs that Zoo was landing on him to, like, break through and knock him out. But everyone thought, oh, yeah, Zoo's a flash in the pan. He can't block a punch. He can't do this. He's too square. He's lucky he never fought Oscar. Yeah, he's a bum, whatever. You know, he's going to fade off into obscurity. Zoo had one of the best comebacks after that knockout uh, that you can imagine. No, he never got the Vince Phillips rematch. <laughs> but, like... You know, he started out slowly. He, he had a few, you know, he knocked out Calvin Grove in the first round, a couple other guys. But once he got once he got that momentum again and became champion, first beating Dio Bellas Retardo, 
and then beating the hell out of Raphael Wellis as well as the Hurtado fight was really good too. That shit's that's, underrated. That's a closet classic, man. That is one of the best fights, five round fights you would find on boxing after dark. Because like we talked about Hurtado from before, bro. Guy couldn't really take a punch and he would run out of gas, but he had incredibly fast hands. He would engage with you and he had pop. He was faster than Zoo. And when they, you know, when they, Zoo was not a guy that's, Zoo was totally a guy that would exchange with you. And Hurtado was quicker than him. First round, yep. bah, 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 catches him, Zoo goes down. Oh, fuck. <laughs> and then you get that giant welt under his eye that starts growing that really, really nasty mouse. And Hurtado was hanging with him until Zoo finally knocked him out. And what I love about that, in the post fight interview, they're talking about, this is not, you know, this is a giant blob welt that's under Zoo's eye. Like, it was nasty. And Zoo was like, oh yeah, just a scratch. Just a scratch. Mm, nothing. Yeah. The, and the, the also the classic, don't be rude to me, please. Yeah, yeah, totally. The Jim Gray. <laughs> Fucking Jim Gray, dude. Never ending. Oh, 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 never ending, man. How many it was? It's been almost three decades now of him just getting fighters pissed off post fight interviews. Yeah, whatever sport he's in, dude. It's baseball, boxing, whatever. Just a dick. He should send a Christmas card every year to James Tony thanking him for sparing his life that time. Seriously, dude. Slapping the microphone out of his hand, bro. He could have done worse. I don't man. like you, man. I don't like you. I don't even man. like you. <laughs> Fucking James. <laughs> Dude, all right. So I got one more that I didn't want to miss, though. That that people that Australian the hardcore fans would be pissed if we didn't at least mention mention him. And that's Les, Les Darcy. I was about to say totally. Yeah, totally. because I mean, he is at this point like almost kind of like a uh, like a like a Harry Grab or a young Stribbling or something mm -hmm. like that. You know what I mean? Just like a... More so too, I guess, a Greb than the Stribbling because Stribbling was around for a long time. And we that's, saw yeah, that's it. true. And, you know, he was only 21 or 22 when he died. You know, he had like 50 fights or something like that. He won the Australian middleweight, I think light heavyweight and heavyweight title, you know, massive stuff. And he wound up dying uh, because he had to get teeth taken out and had a procedure done and died as a result of that in like 1916. So, I mean, you know, it's definitely a case of what could have been. What was that? I'm sorry. No, I just heard some crazy shit outside my apartment. I was like, what the hell? Um, okay. Um, so, you ever just hear random stuff being yelled? I just, I think it was some homeless person just going wild out there. But, um, okay. Yeah, it well, doesn't happen nearly as much here in Vancouver, Washington, as there in New York City. But yeah, it, it you know, I'm sure. No, I it have. Does I have well, it's like I, I don't have. I don't have my AC on right now, so I have my window open with like a screen in front of it, and I just heard. Whoa! Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's bad. People go nuts for knuckles and gloves, bro. I mean, I don't know what totally. the fuck to tell you. So, um, Les Darcy, and like you said, man, a very, very good career, a short career, but a good one, and he beat a lot of contemporary middleweights of his era. And beat them thoroughly, like you know, for instance, Eddie Magudi. Um, but you know, he was labeled a draft dodger, wasn't he? I think so. Yeah, like yeah. the yeah. It was like, when he came to America. There was already like I, I think the news had already leaked that like all this stuff. And by the time he came, that here, he, he went to America to yeah to avoid the war and exactly. stuff like that. And yeah, people, you know, obviously look at Jack Dempsey and others. They didn't take too kindly to that. So yeah there was uh so world war one it obviously would have been which was an awful bloody war mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. there were a number of fighters right around that time for instance mickey walker came up right at the end of world war one because you know that's when a number of young men had gone to war anyway we won't get into that but yeah that was part of les darcy's you know backstory or whatever was that he had gone to america or that he had gone uh, you know, he had flown the coop to avoid getting drafted in the World War One or whatever the case may be. But and that's tough, man, because back then, when foreign fighters obviously had to like you know sail over here, so it took them a minute. And the anticipation was building. Obviously, all the newspapers keep on talking about their impending, um, you know, arrival and everything. A lot of them, it's you know, curiosity and kind of popularity, you know, and want to finally get to see him. Darcy is just was pure. <laughs> and imagine coming up and you're really excited to show your talents in america and everybody hates you yeah dude that would have been a that would have been a, a pretty tough time too for boxing in the u.s it would have just been a weird time for boxing in the u.s in the teens yeah. so man yeah and, well you know in the late heavyweight division man it's sad because darcy came at a time when like you know, the light heavyweight division was still popular. I mean, it was. It wasn't, you know, the golden torchbearer that the heavyweight division that Dempsey was ruling was there. But, like, 
you know, at this point around his era, like you had guys middleweight, light heavyweight, um, a lot of, you know, popular fighters, like some of them were still, were fading out a little bit. We were still hanging on like Papke, Frank Claus, Eddie Magudi, like I mentioned, um, Carpentier, um, Battle and Seek, you would be on the scene still, uh, soon. Like, you know, battling Levinsky, Jack Dillon. Like, there yeah. was, you know, a lot of tough, tough guys right there. And Darcy was showing himself to be either at their level or maybe even a cut above them. You know, it's it's sad that you never – that we don't know how, um, how far he could have gone. And he's basically forgotten now. If, unless you're a historian that, like, you know, really studies this stuff and goes back in yeah. time and tries to go into it. He died over 100 years ago. You know what I mean? Or whatever it may be like, it's people like that just get lost in history. Well, and that's, that's exactly why why we talk about them today. I was got to say, dude, that's why we got to bring that shit up because otherwise it's going to get forgotten. And otherwise we will lose all credibility down in Australia where where we're trying to get in. We're trying to get an Australian deal. Yeah. I want to visit one day. I'm not sure if I'm ready for a 15 hour plane ride, but yeah, Yeah, I don't really want a 15 hour plane ride, but I'd be down to, I'd be down to go see what Australia is all about. You know? Oh, yeah, if they man. let me in, I mean, they're not, they're not letting Devin Haney's dad in. They need to let me One in. One of my we'll closest see. friends, genius on his part, because he, he was able to do this for his job. Um, when it was wintertime over here and he didn't want to deal with the, you know, East coast winter, which I totally don't blame him because. Yeah. It's, it's summer down there. It's summer down there. You know what he did? He told his job, I'm going to be working remotely. And he flew down to Australia, rented out a place and stood there for like three months until it got better over here. Then he came back. That's the that's the fucking king level shit right there. That's yeah, genius, totally, bro. Totally. And that is his job let him do it. He was like, yo, I'm going to Australia for a bit. I'll be back. <laughs> and then just flew out there and, and hung out for a few in, for a few months. Fucking hey, bro. Dude, scope the Sheila's, you know, do yeah, some yeah. fucking good couple cold ones. You're all right. It's and good he shit. Like, yeah, he was like, I just went there, just worked off my laptop, did my thing. He was like, I just didn't want to deal with I was like, I was he was like, I just really didn't want to deal with the winter. I was like, so you went to Australia. He was like, so, yeah, so you literally <laughs> went to the other side of the world. All right. All right. All right. I dig the cut of your jib there, buddy. Yeah. Not, bad. Not fucking so. bad. Now, look, dude, it's going to be uh, it's going to be a big fight this weekend. Australia is going to be rocking. You know, Melbourne's going to be fucking Marvel Stadium. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Dude, it's going to be. I'm, I'm really. Do you know what time is going to be on? Is it going to be early in the morning? I'd have to look, but I'm pretty sure it comes on morning time, my time. So I, I'm, oh God, now I'm gonna have to look again. But I'm, I thought it came on morning time, my time. Shit, now I feel bad. But uh, well, whatever. I'll probably put the schedule or some shit like that when I edit the edit the video yeah, file. Yeah, but... and we have some homies over there that are gonna be at the fight, like our boy Corey, Corey Erdman. That's right. Corey's gonna be, I think, calling the undercard. I would imagine. And uh, you know, Corey does a lot of work. Man, I'm, I'm jealous. I'm jealous of the fact that he just gets to go to Australia. That's fucking awesome. It was also, there have been a number, you know, Daniel Gaylor. I know that's a dude on Twitter who tunes in and he said he's listened a bunch of times. Uh, oh gosh, I, I don't know why I'm uh, Anthony Ox. Uh, there's a whole bunch of people. Anyway, long story short, there's a number of uh, history fans from Australia who would probably be tuning in. I know we'll be tuning in this weekend. Fights can be big, dude. So I hope it entertains. I hope that, you know, we get a definitive result and it's what everybody wants. Bro, I appreciate you remembering the history with me, man. It was a lot of fun. Last man, I had a lot of fun doing this episode, bro. So, yeah. So hopefully people, hopefully people listened in, and hopefully you're not taken from this that we're saying these are the definitive greatest fighters of Australian history. But literally just picking guys off the top of our head and just we just want to remember interesting stories, remembering different things, you know obscure guys popular guys whatever it is yeah we just want to remember we just want to have some fun so hopefully you had some fun listening in uh if you did listen in via a podcast app i know a lot of you do if you would subscribe leave a comment we appreciate that stuff also rate us if you watched on youtube subscribe leave us a comment suggestion we're always open to that kind of stuff and we appreciate that as well on social media the knuckles and gloves podcast is on both facebook and instagram we're also on uh twitter but we're on twitter individually as well you can follow my boy eris pina at punch zone eris follow me patrick connor at patrick m connor that's it man we will come at y'all later eris thanks bro all right thanks man enjoy everyone enjoy the fights this weekend thanks for tuning in as always peace out everybody